you'll be spinning, you'll be puking, you'll be on the moon. I think you're gonna puke in under three minutes if it happens. Anything for that it might come. It might what come? Why? Who knows? Bonk, put it on the yeah. <laughs> okay, Hank. Jesus that was Christ. Re- that was weird. That was really weird. That, yeah. that kind of ruined the vibe. On today's part of my take, we have a great guest, great interview. Jake Arietta, former Cy Young champion, world champion, talks all baseball. I think he'll be uh, a guest going forward talking baseball because it was great to talk to him. Some cool stories. We also have the opening weekend of NBA playoffs. Ball is life. Some awesome games. Even games that were blowouts were awesome. Uh, I I don't know. I don't know if it's too late to say this, but crowds being back. It's fun. Crowds are crowds all wait, the way back. Is this the first time that the crowds have been officially back in the NBA? It was like halvesies last year so yeah, for the first time. This round. is I think Yeah. No, you know what it's gonna be? When Toronto fans come back for NHL playoffs. Yes. At that point, we have to stop crowds saying crowds back. are back. Yes, crowds back. Um, we're going to talk a little Kyrie, uh, who's back. And then we got a Monday reading for everyone. And before we do that, our friends at Helix Sleep are back. Why would you buy a mattress made for someone else? With Helix, you're getting a mattress that you know will be perfect for the way you sleep. Helix Sleep has a quiz that takes just two minutes to complete and matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. Everybody's unique, and Helix knows that. So they have several different mattress models to choose from. They have soft, medium, firm mattresses. Mattresses great for cooling you down if you sleep hot. I'm a hot sleeper. I need to get cooled down. Mattresses great for spinal alignment to prevent morning aches and pains, and even a Helix Plus mattress for plus size sleepers. I feel like this ad was made for me. I took the Helix, Helix quiz and I was matched with the Helix Midnight Lux mattress because I wanted something that felt medium firm for my back. So if you're looking for a mattress, you take the quiz, you order the mattress that you're matched to, and the mattress comes right to your door shipped for free. Go to helixsleep.com slash PMT. Take their two-minute sleep quiz and they'll match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. They also have a 10-year warranty, and you get to try it out for 100 nights risk-free. So if you don't like it after uh, within 100 nights of sleeping on it, risk-free. They'll even pick it up for you if you don't love it. Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash PMT. Make sure you're sleeping correctly. Make sure you're sleeping with the best. helixsleep.com slash PMT. Okay. Let's go. Welcome to part of my take presented by Helix Mattresses. Go right now, uh, helixsleep.com slash PMT. You get $200 off your mattress order and two free pillows. Today is Monday, April 18th, and ball is life. NBA playoffs, baby. What a weekend. Great start. The game that we're all looking forward to was the Bucks. Uh excuse me, not the Bucks. The uh no. the Celtics and the Nets. That's the Womp bet. Everyone here is invested. Jake probably more so than anybody else. Uh where we'll have to take a full tin of dip if there's a whomping. And nobody whomped anybody. Really. No. Really, it was just a great game. It's it's I'm excited to watch the rest of the series. Hank. I'm curious to know your thoughts. I know that you probably went from like being super confident to being like, oh, shit, the sky is falling, to being like, oh, shit, great job. I'm glad that we won that one, but still a little bit concerned. Yeah, you had a moment where it was like, this could be a very bad loss because the Celtics were cruising. Celtics were cruising, and then Kyrie dominated in a way that you haven't seen since like he was on the Cavs. And it was just like, this is the worst. He was talking shit before, and he's backing it up. He's hitting every single shot. The Celtics blew a 13-point lead. They have, like, they were... They had to execute perfectly at the end of the game, and they did somehow, and it was an unbelievable finish. So can I ask a question about Kyrie? Because it's going to be the big story going into Monday. Yes. Where do you stand with him? Because from a neutral party perspective, and I think PFT probably agrees with me, I love every second of it. At this point, it feels like it's fair play across the board. If you miss the game, Kyrie, uh, at halftime, someone called him like a bitch, and he said, suck my dick, uh, to a fan. He was giving. He said, "Suck my dick, bitch." Suck my dick, bitch. 
Uh, he was giving fans the middle finger. He was giving fans the middle finger behind the head, which was a super sneaky, great move. He was doing the cry face. And what we like in sports, he was backing it all up, and he was playing out of his fucking mind. And at the end of the day, as long as it like doesn't cross a line, I think this is great for sports. I think Celtics fans should boo the fuck out of him, should hate him with the fire of a thousand suns, and Kyrie should do everything back to them. And that is what sports is all about. I fully agree. I mean, it's like you want the villains to embrace being a right. villain. He's embracing it. Sort of. <laughs> sort of, but it's like, it's it. as long as he doesn't get mad now, he's like, I don't like being called like a pussy and a loser. And now, obviously, that's all anyone's going to do. But yeah, if he's going to back it up, it's war. It's war times. Like, yeah. Yeah. all is fair in war. Yep. Period. That's what they say. Yep. I think that uh, Kyrie is actually, here's what's going to happen, because I do agree with Big Cat's take that it's all good. Like, I, I like the dynamic. And... I actually, Love it. I actually think that Kyrie likes the dynamic, too. He said, so after the game, he did say, like, when people start yelling pussy and bitch and fuck you, there's only so much you can take as a competitor. Like, what does he think not, is going to happen after wait, that, Wait, 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 wait. He, yeah. He's like, nah, fuck that. That's the playoffs. It is what it is. I know what to expect in here. I'm going to give that same energy back to them. And then after that, the quote that's not being, because I watched his press conference, and they're taking that quote, and now the media is like, it's so disgusting what's happening with the fans and Kyrie. After that... Kyrie said it was fun. Yeah. Going back and forth. He said embrace it. I, yeah. Embrace he said, the darkness. He said embrace it, and he said it was fun. Um, you know, when people start yelling pussy and bitch and fuck you and all this stuff, it's about so much you can take uh, as a competitor. And, um, you know, we're the ones expected to be docile and be humble and take a humble approach. Nah, fuck that. It's the playoffs. This is what it is. You know, I, I've, I know what to expect in here, and it's the same energy I'm giving back to them. It is what it is. I'm not really focused on it. It's fun. You know what I'm saying? And I I love I love that. That's awesome for sports. It's good. Like people are always like, Oh, I miss the days when players and teams hated each other and hated cities. Well, guess what? That's what you're getting right now. Well, We're in the middle of a player and a city hating each other and also that translating into great basketball on the court. And Kyrie's having fun. I'm just worried that what's gonna happen is since all these quotes are being taken out by the media People are going to be like they're going to turn Kyrie into like a big victim and everything, I and then know. turn and then turn the Celtics fans into like the big bullies. The media doesn't like the I, anti-vax guys. Well, here's though. the thing: it's a, it's a media, the it's thing, a, they're it's a, a rock and a hard. The place. media here's also the likes the Ramadan fast yeah. guys, so it's like <laughs> but, he, he, Kyrie's got everybody all fucked up. I really do think that they're going to make this a thing where they're going to vilify. Hank's beloved Boston fan. I, well, that's easy. No, but that's here's, you do it, too. Wait, here's like the, the thing. Easiest, here's here's all I'll say. Fruit. Here's I'm all defending say. you right now, though, Here's Hank. all I'll say. Is Thank that you. I think You're that's welcome. out the window. Again, until there's a line crossed, I think it's. I, I don't think there's going to be a vilifying of either side because Kyrie's literally giving the finger to, like, kids and families, which I'm cool with. Yes. I want that to happen. He's telling people to suck his dick. I think that makes it a little bit harder for people to be like, poor Kyrie. Also love that Kyrie, before the series said uh so giving the energy to what the fans are doing that's not where my attention is and then he walked on the court and that was like again he he backed it up in play like if he sucked i think that you'd have a, a different story where it's like oh the fans got Kyrie off his game he wasn't playing you know up to you know the level that he should be playing especially because the nets need him at that level but he was incredible and it all was good like i loved every second of it i just i want more of it that's what sports are all about guys Fans hating a certain player, a player upping their game to stick it to the fans. And then, of course, Hank, you end up winning the game with, you know, Kevin Durant, who didn't have his best game, uh, losing Jason Tatum with two seconds left. And after the Celtics missed a million layups, they win with a buzzer beater layup, which doesn't happen very, very often. They played, they, the Jalen Brown scored right away on the two for one possession that they had to have. Like that was an the easy layup somehow. Is bad. Yeah. And then the Celtics played unbelievable defense on Kyrie and KD in the possession right before they won. And you made a great point uh, when we were just hanging out before the show. You're like, old Marcus Smart takes that three. And he would have. Yeah, he well, definitely would have taken well, that, that three. That possession at the end there with Marcus Smart, that's like that's the give and take that you have when you have a, a certifiably crazy person on your team. Because sometimes he'll make a stupid play and it'll just completely ruin it. This was honestly like 
it was a borderline stupid play the way that it all unfolded. That's clearly not like what they had drawn up. But he's so crazy that he's the only player in the league that's crazy enough to make that play yeah. and get the ball to Tatum. I also think it's not even old Marcus Smart. It's like you could the same thing could happen next game and he, he might do shoot it. it. Yeah. yeah, like yeah. that was just we got yeah. lucky. But it was a great game one. Um, it is the series that everyone will be talking about because it's definitely like the Nets are not a usual seven seed. Like that's the thing is their star power doesn't make them anno- I I. I, I doubt there's been a time where a two versus seven has been close to a pick 'em in the series, and uh, yeah, we're we're, gonna we're go. now yeah we're gonna go on on next Monday in Brooklyn. Now the Celtics are one win away from avoiding a whomping. They are yes. So we'll see now. But the but I don't first think first serve goes to the Celtics I, on the womp. I think they they held serve. This was a lucky revenge game. The leprechaun was out for blood, but I don't think that Hank. If, if I were in your position, I wouldn't feel like super confident. No, every going game's going to be like this. They're two really good teams. But winning the first game, you're yeah. more confident. In that that, that, that would be an extremely deflating loss. That if was the Celtics had lost, and I'm sure the Nets and the Nets fans are like, "Fuck." Yeah, yeah I, I, I think can. game one for the Celtics was a must win. They had to have that one. They had to have that one the way it played out. Like they had to have a. a, a they couldn't. Yeah, they lose had to have with a 13 point after, lead yeah. and blow it with Kyrie hitting like every single jumper to beat them, that would be yeah. soul crushing. Going into the game, it wasn't – neither team had to win it. But yeah. the way the Celtics were going to lose it would have been very, very bad. Um, all right, so we should just – I mean, there was there was great basketball all around. Uh, I don't know. We could start with Saturday afternoon. Luka not playing is a huge bummer because I think I've come to the conclusion, and I don't know if we have Jazz fans that are, are uh, you know, fans of this show, maybe a few. I'm so sick of this Jazz team. I want them out of here. Yeah, they're like they're the sick of each other. Yeah, they are. They're, they hate each other. This this is the one series that we told you you did not have to pay attention to if Luke is not playing. Right, it's he should be, be back. It's gonna be boring. He, but even when he comes back with a calf injury, yeah, he's not gonna be Luca. He's gonna be lowercase L Luca. But they almost won. They the the Mavs almost won. And I'm just I don't know. I just want. It feels very reminiscent of that Clippers team when we were like get you know get them out of our face. Where it's like I just don't want to be told that. Rudy Gobert and Mike Conley and Donovan Mitchell are going to have like an extended run in the playoffs. How Just much, get him out of my How much face. is Mike Conley getting paid right now? Is he still it's on good that amount. huge contract? And when good he got signed, him. everyone was like, that's a key piece. Good for him. So I'm just, I just, I want Luka to come back and do some fucking cool shit. Um, I think it's a perfect team for Utah. You just, you get to have a team that's good during the regular season, go on your little corporate events, your youth group retreats to the games, win most of them. Three and years, $68 million. Pretty nice for Mike Conley. Former this is year teammate. three, though? This is year three, I think? No, this is year one. Oh, it's year one? And they don't even have Joe Ingles oh, anymore. Signed, yeah. He was like there. Yeah. He was like the lovable. Joe like Ingles I liked, I liked, I liked him a lot. You're for, right. Uh, Mike Conley, former teammate of Mark Titus. Yep. Be interesting to see what, like, how much money Mark Titus's teammates have gotten over Decent the years. Decent amount. Yeah. I mean, Evan Turner's over a hundred million mm-hmm. alone. Greg so. Oden. I heard Greg Oden's now an assistant coach um, somewhere in Indiana. I forget what school he's at. Well, now. he was he's making he was, money. He was a grad assistant on Ohio State for a while there. So, mm-hmm. um, and he should. My rule should be allowed. He should be able to play for the Buckeyes. That would be awesome. Yeah. Greg Oden was playing for the Buckeyes. Um, the the T Wolves. We, I now am rooting for the T-Wolves to go to the finals just to see if we can get crazy protesters at every NBA city in America. That was so Because we had awesome. another one. We had, a, we had someone who, a woman who chained herself to the, to the basket and uh, stopped the game. Same, same deal. Protesting Glenn Taylor, killing a lot. Like, this guy, this guy, are, are, do you think these women that are, are like, gluing themselves and chaining themselves to the basketball uh to the hoop were they relatives of the chickens i don't they're just they're very upset i think they're pro bird flu it's crazy that's what it sounds like to me it sounds like they what they want instead of exterminating the chickens that are sick is for the chickens to go on and infect other chick they think that not enough birds got killed like i would probably if if glenn taylor killed a family member of mine i might glue myself to to the baseline once I don't know if I'd go to game two. I don't I don't know. Like, it's very Minnesota nice the way that they're doing it. They're like, we're going to cause a scene, but real briefly, we don't want to really interrupt the, chain, the game. The chain kind of upped it because the chain, they had a little trouble getting the chain off. So the chain kind of upped the deal. I don't know. I'm excited to see what they have planned next. I don't I don't know where you go from here. Now, are they, are they, they also, working together or is this just like a copycat? I don't know. And they also like, they're going to blow through their budget. Yeah. I don't like as they, as if the T-Wolves progress. 
it's going to be tough to keep, to keep this budget going where they're buying like the best seats in an NBA playoff game just to get kicked out. So I'll say this. The first one was funny. The second one also funny because she looked like Janet from The Sopranos. Mm -hmm. The third Janice. Janice, excuse me. Uh, Hank, she's the one that like got into a fight with Tony at the dinner table because she used to Her sister. blow a bunch of guys. Yeah, yeah sister. Um, but if it happens a third time, I actually think I'm going to start to – be sympathetic to their cause so, i'm gonna be like yeah that guy did kill a lot of birds that's, oh that's how it works for me if, if you do it three times then i'm like wait something's up here they they must have a very good point oh see i'm gonna go reverse and be like glenn taylor you should just execute a bird live before the game Ooh. like at center court if he just comes out and just chops off a bird's head and be like what do you want me what do you want from me now bitches i'm i i shudder to think what they'll do at commander's games <laughs> with carson Wentz as a quarterback if they're anti-bird murder yes there we go. <laughs> Link that in. Yeah. Because he, he, he hunted all those ducks. Yep, exactly. Yes. Um, yeah, that game was awesome. Anthony Edwards is fucking awesome. I don't know. Like, this is – we shouldn't overreact to every uh, game one because I, I do think the Grizzlies will have a, a, an answer for this, but it was just – Really fun watching everyone make the jokes about the Timberwolves winning the championship and thinking there was going to be a letdown spot, and there was no letdown spot. No, I mean, the Timberwolves, they've got I mean, they've got momentum. I'm a believer in momentum. And I am going to do the thing where we take game one and blow out our proportion. Yeah, and Carl Anthony Towns, I, the, you know, he's... So th the other note of this game was ESPN's audio went absolutely haywire, and, like, I, I, thought, my, I thought my TV was blowing up. And uh, then they had Stephen A. Smith and Greeny call the game for like half a quarter from the Brooklyn studios. And Stephen A. Smith was just bashing Carl Anthony Towns. He, like, yeah. he literally was just doing first take for a live game. But Carl uh, Anthony Towns, I, something about him, he just like when he fucks up, he, at least like twice a game, he'll throw a pass into like the fifth row. And he'll look around at everyone like it was someone else's fault but him. Mm -hmm. and you're like, what? What's going on? He's here, got, dude? He also has a great perplexed face. Yeah, it, he's really he just good. Looks at, around like, like remember what? When, when Russell Westbrook missed that three this year, and he was like looking around like, I can't believe that's a yeah, that's an NBA shot. It's like he's a tennis player looking at their racket like, is there a hole in this? Yeah, like, he's, he's super good at looking confused. Yeah, I I love the fact that ESPN anytime they need something, they literally have like a Stephen A. Smith button that they can smash yes. at any given time because he's paid, what, like $10 million a year? That means he's just on retainer. Yeah, him and if Greeny. You, if, you, if there's a microphone that needs to be screamed in 24 hours a day, you you put up the bat signal and he comes in swooping in. Gre and I, I fucking love it. And having him match up with Greeny is so funny because Greeny knows who the alpha is. Yeah, oh, yeah. Is. Well, he's, I don't, is there ever been a situation where Greeny's been the alpha? No, Greeny is the alpha. That's what right, I'm saying. Like, right, Greeny right. knows that he's calling the shots. The, Stephen A. Smith is lucky enough to be around him. Greeny and, and Stephen A. Smith are like heart surgeons where they just have a beeper at all times. They're like, oh, we need you in the studio. Uh -huh. We got to have you talk. We got to have you fill an hour real quick. At like 11 p.m. Well, for Stephen A. Smith, it's it's very easy. It's like plug and play. If he doesn't know anything about what's going on, he'll just like pick one guy, be like, "That guy's a disgrace." Yeah, and then he'll just talk for like 30 minutes about what a disgrace he is. It was great. It's it was great, a great wrinkle. Yeah. And then we had the Sixers, who I feel like uh, most disrespected teams going into the first round. Heat number one by far. At, I, like, I don't. No one's talked about the Heat, myself included. I'll, I'll put my hand up on that. Rest in peace to Cavs, by the way. We didn't cover that, but oh, yeah. I do think they would have beat the they Heat. They definitely would have. Yeah, yeah. they yep. definitely would have beat the Heat. And then Sixers, I feel like, are sneaky second because everyone was like, oh, if you're looking for an upset, it's like the upset we do in the bracket. Like, oh, if you're looking for an upset, it's the Raptors over the over the uh, Sixers. And then Tyrese Maxey happened, which I have a couple stats that are pretty awesome. Um only a, only a Philly, I think it was like NBC Philly, wrote the article. And uh, the first, it was like, look at these crazy stats from Tyrese Maxey. So he scored 38 points. He's the third youngest guy to do that in an NBA playoff game. Magic and LeBron being the two youngest. So that's pretty good company. But the big stat they had that led the whole article was Tyrese Maxey scored 21 points in the third quarter. 12 minutes of play. Which is more points... Than, a, than the last 100 minutes of Ben Simmons in the playoffs as a Sixer, <laughs> 19. I and love I that. just loved it. Keep it was going like, back to just, it, yeah. Just like, this guy's awesome. Let's bring up Ben Simmons. Yeah, keep and going I, back to it. I appreciate that. I mean, it does serve to highlight just how ridiculous Ben Simmons was at yes. the end of his tenure in Philly. Like, you lose track of, of what a circus it was, especially because of the way the last year has played out since then. 
But yeah, I mean, it does. That's a great use of perspective. Yes, and it also was one of those games that like the the Sixers won it, and I don't think I mean Embiid wasn't like full on Embiid. Like he mm-hmm. wasn't he wasn't Hulk Embiid. We have like he was 17, 18 points, nineteen points, nineteen points, but he was not great shooting, and so that you got to feel pretty confident if you're a Sixers fan watching that, being like, oh yeah, Harden and Embiid weren't. Like it wasn't like your stars beat him. Tyrese Maxey beat them. Harden wasn't bad though, but I can't figure out if that's a case of having like the lowest possible expectations for James Harden and him barely surpassing those. I think he went like four for seven from three. Yeah. So he he made he made a few outside shots, which he hasn't been doing recently. And also maybe it was just Rosillo poisoned our brains. Yep. And telling us would it, it'd be very funny if if James Harden just had like the playoffs from hell this year and just dominated everybody. He got the he got the MVP over Chris Paul in the yeah, finals. Yeah. Maybe even maybe That's even actually let, I'm rooting for that now. Maybe even let Chris Paul win the finals and have Harden win the MVP in a losing effort. <laughs> that would be hilarious. And you just have to tip your hat. Harden also showed up with one of the craziest uh jackets that I've ever seen that had it had just two puppets attached to his jacket. Mm-hmm. And I guess it's something you could actually buy at Gucci. Um I yeah. I think they just make it for James Harden. He's got the guy. Yeah, he's got the guy. But then they like put it on in the store. So they're like, no, no, no. Everyone can wear this. I bet that there's a guy at Gucci that's like making stuff for James Harden, just doing it as a joke. Like, if I tell him that this is cool, he'll believe it's probably that other Gucci. What is it? The Paolo Gucci? Yeah. The brother that got kicked out of the family that nobody liked? Yeah. It's probably him. That's the guy that's making it. It looked like a a costume where it's like, all right, I have a, a jacket that actually is a real jacket. And then I just have uh, like I I I over ordered bark box toys. Let me just throw a couple of things on this. Yeah, staple Gumby to it <laughs> yeah. and tell them it's cool. Yeah. And then so- Saturday night we were reminded that the Warriors are fucking awesome. Yep. And Jordan we're- Poole is really really good. Warriors are back. Uh, when I said that, like, don't be surprised if this Nuggets team I'm does something. You. Oh, oh, I thought because I thought we're- you also said surprised with the Warriors. No, no, the Warriors are my pick. Yeah, yeah, out yeah. of the West. They're I like pick. that. They're yeah. my pick out of the West. The, the Nuggets. Same. Where my don't be surprised if they do something in the playoffs, which is just again me saying uh, making a pick without ever having to be accountable Correct. for it. But it does all hinge on the fact that they have two other star players that are out. And today I saw an article that Porter is thinking about coming back. Oh, but again, this has been like uh, twice a week in Denver. If, if you need an article that needs clicks or needs attention, just be like Porter's thinking about coming back this week. Yeah, he's been considering coming back for about. Four months, three months now. Yeah, it's I. I've just kind of accepted the fact that it's not going to happen, and the Warriors do have the ability to flip the switch. I'd officially like to. Can I switch permission to switch my pick to the Warriors? Just become a Warriors podcast. Is that okay? I mean, the Suns are are beating the the Pelicans pretty badly in the first quarter here. Is I, that okay? Well, I, I do yeah. think I is do this, think so my Warriors Bucks is my official pick. I do think we could say that like people forgot about the Warriors, even though nobody really did. It's right at that, that stage of them kind of being talked about a little bit less that we can now hold the banner and be like, we're the ones that never forgot about you guys. And I wanted to, there was a, a big storyline because Steph came off the bench because he had been injured and everyone's like, look at this Steph coming off the bench. And usually I'm cynical of these stories that get forced down our throat. But I was like, you know what? That actually is very cool. Yeah. LeBron would never come off the bench. No, no, he How many minutes did he have? He had a shitload of minutes. He had a shitload right? of minutes. But so, Jordan yeah. Poole was able to, like, Jordan Poole had an incredible game, and a lot of that because he started and was, you know, I, I'm just going to give Steph the credit that he deserves in that moment uh-huh. because it is like one of those stories that we probably made too much of a deal about it. But Steph Curry, if he wanted to start with one leg, he would start with one leg. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, he calls the shots. So how does that work in terms of six-man-of-the-year voting? If Steph Curry were to come I don't off, think he's... If he were to come off the bench after, like, sit out the first two minutes of the game and then play for the rest of the game, essentially, could you be six-man, or is it the guy with the six most minutes? I, I don't think you can be six-man just for the playoffs. No, no, I know. I'm saying, like, in, in the, the regular, regular season, season. yes. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Like, well, Manu used to have yeah. starter minutes, yeah. but he would come off the bench. I Speaking of this, the awards... There's no bigger loser than the guy who's still arguing MVP awards as if the the votes haven't been cast. Mm-hmm. Like going game one, oh, and Bede had a bad game one. He shouldn't be the MVP. It's like, dude, it's it's over. Yeah, it's it's already been done. Do you think that there's an element of of the Sixers playing their games in uh, in Canada that like makes us forget about their performance more? I always feel that way. Like if it's against the Raptors for whatever reason. I'm always more likely to gloss over it in the early rounds. I just <laughs> I, I, I don't I don't pay as much attention to that. 
Um, I don't know. That probably says a lot my in- internalized xenophobia. Well, and I'm like, oh, yeah, the Sixers. Uh, here's the best thing I can say about what the Sixers did. They handled their business. Here, here's here's what I think you're getting at, and I agree with this point, is that the, the Raptors really got screwed with Kawhi not coming back. Because teams that don't get to defend their titles, yeah. they don't last in your brain the same way. Yeah, I, you know that I mean? was an awesome team. Too. Right, that right. Raptors team felt different. You want to feel old? No. You gonna tell me how time works? Yeah. That's Riley Curry. No way. Are you serious? <laughs> She's like a full blown adult. <laughs> they showed crazy. her in the game, and I was like, "Wait, what?" Yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, that is how time works. Mm-hmm. Wow. Children become. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if she's a full teenager yet, but like children get older. No, she can't. And it nine. blows our brain. Yeah, yeah she nine. can't be a teenager. Yeah. But still, I mean, you know, we remember when she was two. It's like a, a grown up outfit. She's it's got podcast. like, she's got like zippers and stuff. That's like a tracksuit. That's not something a nine year old wears. Yeah, but it's just, she has a podcast. No, I'm saying like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> we were she podcasting podcast. when she was super yes. young. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the Warriors in 2015, that's when she. Showed up on the stage and, you know, was ripping the curtains down. Well, she's a front runner. She only came out after yeah. wins and she yeah. wouldn't be there to address the media after losses. Yeah, but the Warriors are good. And then, uh, Jake, your heat, handle yeah, business. Yeah, the most disrespected one seed in the history of basketball. I'd agree with you. And it's one thing, like, I think it was the Hawks a few years ago where people were like, ah, oh, they haven't been there before. These guys have been there before. So it's not like mm-hmm. the pressure in the top seed should be scary Bubble. to them. Disneyland. Bubble. Bubble. Oh my god! That was a little Bobby bit. Bobby Jake. It was a little okay. bit different. Okay, Jake, you're in, you're in a room full of LeBron haters. If we concede that the Heat have been there, then we also have to concede that LeBron won. Not ne- not necessarily. Okay, though. Spolstra. Yes, Spolstra has been Spolstra there. Spolstra has definitely been. Haslam, been there. <laughs> he Kyle Spolstra. Lowry. Kyle Lowry, been, been there. there. Yes. Duncan Robinson, maybe the best <laughs> basketball player yeah. podcaster in the history of the medium. Dude, Unreal. He he is putting it on for all like. Representation matters, mm-hmm. and watching a podcaster do what he did today, I see him up there, and I'm like, I doing, can do that. Do what JJ day. never could. I, that could be me. I, I believe that. I yeah. It's, Twenty-seven points. Until I saw him do that, I was well. No, CJ McCollum, probably the best basketball. That's playing true. Podcaster. That's true. But seeing Duncan Robinson do it, it felt like I finally was like, oh, someday I can grow up and and go uh, eight for nine in an NBA playoff mm-hmm. game from three. I love when he when he hits his sick like off balance three point shots. He's the best. Mm-hmm. I, I I like watching him play when he's when he's dialed in. But when he's not, it's very sad for yeah. podcast. I don't claim him when he has an off night. Also, yeah. PJ Tucker. That's when he's that's when he podcasts too much. He mm-hmm. he podcasts. Oh, PJ Tucker's he's been, been there. there. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. got yeah. it. That's true. Yeah. He's a dog. He's defending champion. He is a dog. That is that's absolutely a fact. Um, one last thing about the Celtics Nets game. Hank Tatum doing the look at my hand is the coolest thing ever. When he does an awesome play and he looks at his hand, I think that's one of the coolest like celebrations mm-hmm. that you can do. And his son, I mean, obviously I'm biased, but his his son is cute as fuck, and he's like in, in and around the team, and he's like he's like the mascot he's for them Riley this year. Yeah. Deuce, yeah. wow, Deuce, 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 Deuce Tatum. Like he'll be on the sidelines, and name. Marcus Smart will be like, dude, Deuce Tatum inbounding is the ball, a, and he'll like try and be like punching him and shit. Deuce Tatum's a, like a, a character that Jean Claude Van Damme played in like 1994. I'll send you these pictures; they're fucking everyone. badass. Roadhouse Deuce Two, yeah. Deuce Tatum. Wow, pain don't hurt. What an all right. That's that is some team of destiny shit. Deuce Tatum. Yeah. Um, and then the Bulls totally gave away a game. To the Bucks. You know what that was, though? I think we all forgot about Game 1 Bucks being a thing. <sighs> yeah. Because if you go back last year, I looked this up, actually. If you look at what they did in the playoffs the last two years, I think they've lost all but one Game 1s. So I think they're like they're 1-6 and six and in Game 1s over the last two years. And they and when they lose, they usually get smoked. So if you're going on a like, historical context, this was... This is the chance that you had to beat them. And and the Bulls have a little game one. I, I can't remember if we did it twice. I remember, obviously, um, one time when the Bulls went down to the Heat uh, and beat them game one in the Eastern Conference Final. And then the Heat gentlemen swept them. So, mm-hmm. Bulls have some game one mojo. But, yeah, that was that was a game. I'm I have, My expectations are very low. I've seen some people being like, dude, you're being so down. I, I watched the Bulls. Like, anyone who's watched them has known that they have been – one of the worst teams in the NBA, not just in the playoffs, the last two months. They played a lot harder tonight than they have against good competition in the last two months. They just shot like shit, and a lot of that's Drew Holiday just being incredible at defense. 
But uh, that did feel like a winnable game. The, There's Vu- not a lot that you can do against Giannis, though. But you, Vooch, like, you double team him, and then it's two passes away. But Vooch, DeMar DeRozan, and Zach Levine shot 21 for 71. You can't win like that. No, not great. You can't win like that. So I just went in with very low expectations, and then the third quarter happened, and I was like, ooh, could we could we fight here? And then you lose that way. It feels like that was going to be one of our best shots in this series. Yeah, for sure. Um, Hank, did you want to do your embrace debate real quick? Uh, yeah. We obviously talked about him a little bit earlier with the Heat stuff, but – LeBron has been live tweeting uh, all the games in the NBA, and I was just sitting wondering because on NBA on TNT, they kind of call him out. They go him into coming on and stuff, and this is kind of the first time that he has not been in the playoffs at all. So my embrace debate was, will we see LeBron on the desk as like a panelist at any point during these playoffs? I don't think so. I, I really don't. I think that LeBron is – do they let you drink wine? On the air? Yeah. I think he's – Chuck and Le- Kenny? LeBron is actually becoming more relatable – uh, I know. As he's doing this for And he's getting older. Because he's experienced exactly what we all are doing while we're watching these games, which is getting drunk and tweeting while watching it. So I think LeBron's like, hey, this kicks ass. So I was thinking about it. I actually think we could see it, but I, in a weird way, I think it might be ESPN, not TNT. Anything. Anything. I think, because think about either, it. Either, yeah, Greeny is the consummate, like... You come on this show, yeah, I won't he, ask you a single hard question. Oh, no, Greeny will yeah. – he'll have eight inches of LeBron right, tickling right. his uvula. Stephen A. Smith has never been – like, Skip is the LeBron hater, not Stephen A. Smith. Stephen A. Yeah. Smith isn't a full-on LeBron hater. I feel like that's a soft landing spot. Wilbon. He could even have Magic come on with it. Like, I I think that it, it, was, it would be more likely that it would be ESPN than TNT. They should actually let him do, like, his own Manning cast style thing from his house, just like him – and his daughter drunk on a couch, yep, just watching the games and talking about it. Yeah, I'd I would watch, watch that. Yes, of course. But yeah, he is. He's trying to get in the mix, and uh, I think the problem is he probably like scheduled his his like month long vacation for after the finals, never thinking he wouldn't even be in the playoffs. His family's probably never seen him in May. Yeah. So and like his kids are still in school, mm-hmm. so he's got to sit there on his couch and just be like, "All right, this sucks." But yeah, I, w- I would like to see him on ESPN. That'd be fun. I mean, I think even like the biggest LeBron h- haters would still watch. Of course, because uh, as, as, as we would take because uh, you, yeah, uh, because you need because yeah. you need ammo. Yeah, and that would give uh, you a full clip. It would be incredible. Uh, any other first round, first game, first round notes? I I do. I'm trying not to overreact to the first games, but it is you very did change much, your Warriors pick after one yeah, game. I did. I did. I won. Well, I don't know if you saw, but I put 67 units on that game. So I'm up 65.9 units on the playoffs. That's pretty good. Yeah. No big deal. I do, so I, I was th- very I, happy to watch them. I think that's a smart move, honestly. The Warriors, people forget they're still the Warriors. Yeah. I think, Hank, you've forgotten that they're the Warriors. I made You're them being my a- pick to, to go to the finals. Yeah, that is true. You're forgetting, though, Hank. <laughs> you, should, you should welcome people onto the bandwagon. We're waking people up. I think I, I think I can change my pick this early because we haven't even completed the first game of the first round. And, yeah, I want a big bet on them. So Wait, so does that mean I can I can uh, rescind my whomping? No, the, the womp bet is set okay. in stone. All right. Why are you feeling nervous about no, it? No, I was just curious. I didn't know, I didn't know how the retractions were after the game Celtics one. Celtics might be decent. No, I, I can't I, believe I, I got dragged into this. Oh, oh I Jake. can. I'm sorry for for making you part of the team, Jake. Yeah, content, baby. Let's do it, dude. You think that <laughs> you think the you think the AWLs want to see me, PFT, or Hank put a fucking horseshoe in? No way. Yeah. Nope. You doing it? That's that's asses <laughs> that's, in that's the clicks, seat, baby. Yeah. You'll be you'll be spinning. You'll be puking. You'll be on the moon. I think you're gonna puke in under three minutes if it happens. Anything for that? It might come. It might. What? Come. Why? Who knows? Bonk. Put it on the yeah. <laughs> okay, Hank. Jesus that was Christ. Re- that was weird. That was really weird. That, yeah. that kind of ruined the vibe. Jake, Hank, <laughs> Hank thinks that Jake will come. I don't, I don't think that'll mouthful. happen, Hank. I think a lot of things could happen, but you've never done I mean, one before. You truly that is never true. Know. I mean, that is true. Hank's been on a heater recently. Imagine, yeah. imagine if Jake just nutted. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, called it. Cash those tickets. <laughs> I don't think anybody's ever come from having Ugh. an entire a wampus cat of dip in your mouth. Uh, Billy, what are you going to say? To specify, it is a four-finger dip, so it's not the whole You're, can. You just did three fingers with your hand. This is four with a thumb. thumb. All right, so three fingers and a thumb. Yes, that is the wampus cat grip of the dip. Okay. I love it. 
and I will be doing a Wampus Cat if it goes to Game Six or Seven, just so there's a definite Wampus. Cat. You just want to oh, do nice. it. Oh, nice! That's yeah, actually like a great that, team though. player. Yeah, because so I will participate. <laughs> no, that's huge. Yeah, Billy. so there will be a Wampus Cat because we didn't want like I'll, if if we're doing a, a second take on the whole series, I think it's going seven. Like that was a great game. I wanted to back go and forth, and I, it look it looks like it's going to be a game a series that has like the makings of an all time series just based on game one. Which I said I wasn't going to do, so I appreciate that, Billy. Way to step up. Way to step up. Um, all right, let's do who's back. Who's back is brought to you by our friends at Coors Light. It's a hectic time of the year between weddings, graduations, spring sports, and more. We're busier than ever right now, and sometimes we forget to take a second for ourselves. So this season, take a second to enjoy an ice cold Coors Light because you deserve a beer that's made to chill. There's only one beer out there that's literally made to chill. And that's Coors Light. The mountains on the bottles and cans even turn blue when your beer is cold. That way, you always know when it's time to chill. When you need to hit reset, just open a Coors Light. It's mountain cold refreshment made to chill. Coors Light is cold lagered, cold filtered, and cold packaged. I like to crack open a Coors Light on the weekend when I'm sitting watching hoops. Soon to be some hockey as well. Hockey playoffs coming up in a second. Uh, So Coors Light is the beer to chill when you need to chill out. Take a second off. That's Coors Light. So when you need that second for yourself, reach for a Coors Light, the beer that's literally made to chill. Coors Light Brewing, Golden, Colorado. Celebrate responsibly. You can order on Drizzly or Instacart. So get the Coors Light, baby. Best beer in the world. All right, who's back? Hank. My who's back of the week is Jordan Spieth. Oh, yeah. yeah. Big winner today. Uh, I was looking at him. I thought it was his first win since 2017, but he actually won one last year. But still, there's a four-year gap, five-year, uh, including this year. But won the RBC Heritage in a playoff. He's back. Mm-hmm. He, he, he seemed like you know he, he fell off a little bit. Sometimes with golfers, they are super, super hot. And then once they fall off, they kind of never yep. make it back. Yeah, they get mentally broken. Did you see what was up with, uh, with his wife running up to him after he, went, after he won? He was, no. His wife was carrying their baby with, like, in one hand. And like sprinting down the fairway, like Lashawn McCoy. Yeah, yeah, like carrying like a loaf of bread, and the baby was just like bouncing all over the place as she was sprint- sprinting down to him. It was bad. It was terrible baby security. I, so I, as someone who carries a baby, you you find like the grooves in the baby, and you're able to carry him one handed like that. You gotta watch. You gotta watch this clip though, okay. because but it, I, it I looked, know it looked like she was doing a drill, and somebody was gonna reach out and just slap that arm. I know if you just watched. Like security cam of me carrying my baby, you'd be like, "Oh, dude, that baby's about to fall." It's like, "No, I got it." No, you got no, no problem because you know three points of contact. I got that. She baby. was she was hanging on to it like a yeah. Lashawn McCoy is actually a great comparison as to her baby carrying technique. Uh, all right, that's your who's back. Yep. Any more for who's back? Okay, mm-hmm. I got two. I brought two to the. Oh team. wow! Oh, I didn't know we were doing. I got five. <laughs> I just Billy you know, extra credit Billy. I really I actually did six, but I'm just going to do one. <laughs> All right, so I can keep back? the show moving. Uh, my who's back of the week is staying hydrated, uh, oh, specifically God. Russell Wilson. Oh, staying oh. hydrated. What were you thinking, Hank? I don't know. Your neighbors? Oh no, did no. Did you no. go talk to your neighbors? No, I didn't. I thought you were going to be a converted waterist. No, I might be a waterist. I might be a water guy now. I've been drinking a lot of it recently. It's good stuff. But no, it's uh, Russell Wilson has a new house in yeah. Colorado, bought for $25 million. Looks like a nice place from the outside until you look at the specifics of the house. It's four bedrooms and 12 bathrooms. Ooh. He's got 12 bathrooms in his mansion with only four bedrooms. My only thought is because he's the big Nano Bubbles recovery water guy, he must stay so hydrated that he can't be more than like 100 feet away from a bathroom. I also, like, that's kind of sneaky genius. Because, you, like, if you're... If you're that, if you're Russell Wilson, you don't want friends and family crashing. You'd be like, I got four. You, how many? If you listed Russell Wilson's new house on Airbnb, uh-huh. what do you think it would say that you could sleep? Because you know how Airbnb will yeah. be like four bedrooms. It can sleep twenty five. It's probably it's probably <laughs> nine because you got the master bedroom. Then you've got uh, a theater. Then you've got a theater, but then you've got like two others, and then you got like the lounges. You got the mother-in-law shed in the back for future to stay in whenever yes. he drops into town. Yeah. There's, there's no way. Like they could definitely sleep comfortably twenty people, but it's smart to be like, nope, sorry, 
Don't got any more bedrooms. For, that Four one, bedrooms. That one's actually uh, <laughs> that's well, that one's my film watching room. Yeah, we got so a we full court basketball, but we don't have enough bedrooms. This is my massage room. Yeah, uh, not for sleeping. It does have a bed, but it's yeah. not for sleeping. But yeah, nine car garage, four beds, and and twelve bathrooms. And maybe the most uh, irritating part of his entire house is the basketball court that he has inside. Yeah, it's like a squash court that was converted into basketball. Why not go full? So it's got yeah, it's a half court basketball, but not just half court. But it's also not even wide enough to have anything. It's basically the key. You right. can practice foul shots right. in there. You can play knockout in there. But you can't actually play. Which is fine. Like, if, if one of us had that, that'd be the coolest thing ever. But if you're Russell Wilson and you buy a house for $25 million, I want the full court. Yep. I want a full court. I want not only I, – I, I'll go one more. I want the full court, but I want it to be like middle school where you can drop fucking rims all around. You can play with, you know, there's you got, six rims. You got, yeah, you got six of them. Yeah. Two of them you can lower down yeah. to eight feet if you want to do a dunking contest. Yeah, give that play, play. You could have a fucking AAU camp in your in your house. I would get, I would get a giant scoreboard that's suspended from the ceiling that I would keep track of during my own like pickup games that I've had there. Did you? See? I, I've had like the horn, the buzzer. I, yeah. I have like, oh yeah, a sound system. It'd yeah, sweet. Denny Hamlin has that. Like that's how you got to do it. Did you see? By the way, that guy it went viral. He has a jumbotron in his living room. Yeah, total dudes rock moment. That's awesome. Like no, that has to be the most annoying thing to have, like pretty much every day of the year. Yeah, except maybe Sundays. And then you're like, this is sick. That it, or and then if, your friends leave after watching games there and something like, damn, that Jumbotron was like, did they really have to play Pump Up the Jam during, during the third no, quarter? No, it's, it's an awesome thing for like friends to come over and experience, but then you have to live in a, in a room that <laughs> has a Jumbotron, Jumbotron hanging from the ceiling when you're just trying to watch. And like, you're like, why is my... Shit's Creek. Yeah, why is my, why is my fucking uh, electric bill similar to growing <laughs> like, uh, you know, seven acres of weed? What yeah. the fuck is going on? It is sick, though. Though. Yeah, it was Dude's Rock. Uh, all right, my who's back. So I have two. Uh, one is Ichiro. He threw mm -hmm. some gat. I love Ichiro because Ichiro is uh, the quintessential. I think most athletes are like this, but no one embodies it quite like Ichiro, where you know how it's like you don't retire, the game retires you. Mm -hmm. Ichiro, I think he, like, he, I think he went and played in Japan after he retired. and he came, Well, he came back, and then he went back and played in Japan. He wants to just play baseball till he's – a hundred years old. It, it reminded me so much when he went out on the mound. How awesome those like early two thousand Mariners jerseys were. Yeah, so clean. Yeah, and he came out full full kit, which would normally be like, what the hell is this guy doing? But then he threw gas, ninety three miles an hour. Oh, they had the gun. They on had him? the gun on him. I saw. It looked like he caught the corner. Maybe. Yeah, he was throwing gas. And then my other who's back. We haven't talked about him, but uh, Baker Mayfield. We I think we missed it in the mix of like. All that playoffs starting, but saying that he would like to go to people's work and boo them. I would love to show up to somebody's cubicle and just boo the shit out of them. <laughs> yeah. And see and watch watch them crumble. Ten ten I I say that's acceptable. Yeah. Well, and I would say that if Baker, if like I was making twenty million dollars a year, I'd be I wouldn't be bothered. Yeah, well, probably not, but that's not I Baker. I think so. Yeah. Baker, Baker's never he's always been bothered by everything. Yeah. He should actually he should take that out on Deshaun. Sean yeah. Watson just boom at practice. Yeah, is he gonna? He's not like gonna show up for workouts and stuff, right? I don't know. That would be very awkward if he went into the season as like the backup quarterback on the Browns. Yeah, where is he gonna go? I guess he's got to wait till the draft. Yeah, you never know. You never know. You never. That was know. The podcast. What? Oh, he was on. You never know. The you never know podcast with with mm. Mike, Mike Stud. Stud. Yeah, who is not Mike Stud anymore? Right? Just, just Mike. Mike. Just Mike. Just Mike. Shout out Mike Stud. Just Shout, Mike. Yeah, just Mike. Just Mike. You never know. Yes, um, he's he said, he's an OG. I, yeah, we we've known Mike forever. The I think, video, of the I mean, it was like they're like sitting on his couch, and the video of just Mike's dog was like in the he was sleeping in the background, like rolling around. So that's what everyone was like commenting on. So it was like first take. You're watching Baker Mayfield. You just see his dog that's like, in the all, background. I mean, like, that's genius by yeah, Mike. Dude's rock. Yeah, I think he's, yeah, his dog's nuts. It was like spread eagle. Yeah, on yeah. the couch behind it, like Paul George. Like Paul dog. George. Yeah, yeah. Baker just has his elbows him? in it. Yeah, how about Paul George? Genius. I didn't even know they were testing for COVID anymore. Just Paul. He's just Paul, like Paul, was, Paul was driving on the way to the stadium. He was like, you know, I'm going to swing by CVS real quick, <laughs> pick up a PCR, just we in case. Spit on this, yeah, <laughs> playoff swab. PCR is what they're calling them. Yeah, just maybe a little red ink. All right, I'm out. Mm -hmm. 
No one can make fun of me. Was, I, I mean, he was genius. smart. I yeah. Don't, I don't think he was going to do anything this postseason that would have even begun to change the narrative about him. He so probably called up, Yeah, he probably called up Kawhi and was like, so, and Kawhi was like, nah. He's like, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. I'm out. Kawhi's going to be back, like, uh, February of next year. Yeah. I think, and that's when playoff people will be like, okay, let's, this is the year. Kawhi. It never felt like this was, you know what, I'm glad that he did that because I don't even think I could have mustered up the energy to enjoy a playoff P playoff L right. like it, it wouldn't have been the same. I, I had no expectations for right, him. Right. There's no buzz around him next year. When Kawhi comes back, then we'll be like, okay, this is a Clippers year. It'll be so much more satisfying to watch him lose. Yeah. So thank you, Paul. God bless Kawhi Leonard, because I, I think this is by design, but there's never been a superstar in any league that you just forget exists for like great lengths of time. Mm-hmm. And I think that he enjoys it that way. He's a slow healer. I think he'd rather us just forget he exists but it's happened multiple times in the last five years where you're like, oh, Kawhi, yeah, yeah, when, mm-hmm. what's he up to? I mean, the beauty about NBA contracts is that you can do stuff like this. Yes. You can just straight up, like what Zion's doing, Yeah, you can just be like, I, you know what, I think I'm going to burn a Dude. year off my deal and not play. That And everyone's like, well, shit, we didn't think about that when we did the CBA. I guess it got us by the balls now. That, that Zion statement, I had some big-time Derrick Rose flashbacks when the, the exact wording was, Zion and his team disagree with the Pelicans' assessment of his injury. I was like, oh boy, that's never good. I mean, if, that's the start of the end. If you're Zion, strictly from like a business standpoint, it's a smart move what he's doing. You would rather that if you have a player on your team that, that you draft first overall to be like the future of your organization, you'd want that ideally to be a guy that wants to play and wants to help his team win. But from a business standpoint, there's really nothing – that's stopping him from just being like, no, I don't feel like coming back right now. Right, and then disagree. Getting, and then getting another year closer to a Big Max contract. Like, I just imagine that conversation going down where, and I, I actually do side with the players more often than not because team doctors are employed by the teams and they, their literal job is to get players to play through anything. Mm-hmm. But just having like the idea that they're sitting down in a medical office and the doctor's like, so Zion, you're 100%, and he's just like, Disagree. Uh huh. Was it? Nope. Was not it playing? Derrick Rose's cousin? No, his brother. His brother. Yeah. He's yeah. like, well, my brother. My brother doesn't think so. It was just not. It was. It was never like as overtly as th- this one was just straight up. Nope. We disagree. But it was just bad all around. Like he could come back, but he doesn't want to come back. But they don't feel he's healthy. But he is. Who knows? Um, I do. I I will say that I've heard like players interviews, and we've talked to guys, you know, football players especially, where they're like, yeah. Team doctors will just lie just to get you back out there. Yeah. So no, I, I, I I should walk that back. I do. I will side with Zion. I completely. Even though it's frustrating. I understand it. And even if, if he is doing a thing where he's just like, I want to get a year closer to getting a big contract. Right. And getting in a position where uh, I'm being paid a shitload of money as opposed to just like a, a decent amount of money. I understand that from a business aspect. But also, if I was like a fan of the team, yeah, no, that's it. Then I then I'd be like, God damn it, please play. I, I've I've been looking for. I went out, I bought your jersey the day you got drafted. This was something that I was very excited about, and now it's not happening. I would be disappointed if I was in that position. Exactly. From afar, I side with Zion in this, but I know that having lived through it, I was like, Derek, please fucking play. Yeah. And and Pelicans fans have every right. To in just theory, be mad. I think that this is a good thing. When it happens to me, I'm very, I'm very, it's like communism. (laughs) Yeah, right. I'm, I didn't sign up for this. Mm -hmm. Uh, All right, Billy. Uh, Someone has to do it. My who's back is Jesus. He there it back. is. Good point. Yep. Uh, Someone did shout have to out do that. Big man. Yeah. Uh, I'm mad that you took off your Easter shirt. You look so handsome. I, I was stunting. Billy came (laughs) straight from church. Billy got an Easter haircut. Excuse me. You dyed the tips invisible. Tips Easter invisible. You had. You shaved for Jesus? You get yes, any I cash? Did. You get any presents? No. You get any chocolate? I'm part of the, I'm in like the time of my life where there's no little kids in my family yet. Mm-hmm. So like all the holidays kind of don't have like a childish vibe anymore. That's just, mm-hmm. Yeah. So I you start, don't have a kid. Yeah. Yeah. You got to start fucking. Yeah. Got to work on that. Anyway. You'd be uh, a good dad, Billy. I'd be hyped to be, uh, not yet. No, uh, but I, you would be a good dad. I'm saying that right now. I appreciate that. Yeah. I think Whitey's you're a great a, dad. Whitey's a very well behaved dog. Yeah. You got you got True. good dad I did, energy. I, I did hang out with Whitey a little bit this weekend, and you can tell a lot about a uh, a person from mm-hmm. how their dog behaves. And Whitey is just like this little tiny meathead that just runs around <laughs> not really making any sense with what he's doing. It's it's perfect and cat very well behaved though. Yeah. It's basically like Billy. So my other who's backs are football ish. 
Oh, yeah. Football, football's kind of back. USFL. Yeah, Jeff Fisher. Looked awesome. Mm-hmm. Back. He he looks like in shape. He, mm. he was just looking good. That's that's the extent of the USFL coverage I had was uh, I just saw Jeff Fisher. <laughs> mm-hmm. I was like, that's cool. And, oh, and Paxton Lynch, fuck yeah, that guy. Yeah, Paxton Lynch. Fuck yeah. him. So he had a pick and a fumble Good after coming back in. And it, there were bad picks and yeah. bad fumbles, too. I know you still hate him for that uh, Memphis him. Bowl game. Yep. Most so importantly, bad. though, Kyle Sloter finally started in a regular season professional mm. game this weekend. And? He won. Nice. So I put. A, I actually had a future down on whatever the team, New Orleans Breakers, I think. Yeah, sure. You could say any name. I don't know. There's like a Bandits that's in there somewhere. Yeah. But there's, it's very funny to see like these teams that no one's ever seen play before and then they have odds as to who's going to win the regular season championship it's like right how does anybody have any idea what's going to happen and and is this season even going to make it to the end i just yeah. know that there was a moment i put it i saw jeff fisher pop up on my timeline so i put it on one of my tvs and it was halftime and it was jeff fisher and todd haley and i was like oh this is sick and then i still didn't watch yeah so i'm just i i love football but spring football just doesn't yeah. i want i actually you want to know what's sick I actually watched some spring football games, and I wouldn't watch the USFL. Like, I watched a little bit of Georgia spring football game. I watched a little bit of Ohio State's. Mm. Shout out Vandy that can't even get a win in their spring football <laughs> game. They tied. How bad is that? They tied. 32-32. <laughs> like, you can't even get a win in your spring football game. Uh, the, the kicking game is awful in the USFL. Yeah. Missed field goals left and right. One of the kickers was Zach Galifianakis' cousin. They, oh, that's they cool. made sure to say that. Also, in other non-NFL football that, news. That definitely was brought up in like some big meeting. They like, were like, who do we got? Well, we got Zach Galifianakis' cousin. Good, that's going to do real well on social clip. <laughs> Terrell Owens scored a touchdown in the fan-controlled football. League. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. I saw that as well. You know, fade. At the end of the game, garbage yeah. time. Also, guess who else is back? Swedish House Mafia. Just dropped an album on Friday. First album in 10 years. Whoa. Swedish House Mafia might be not as big of a deal in your life as it was in mine, but Swedish House Mafia is pretty awesome. Billy, so. 10 years ago, I was way more in drinking age than you. Yeah, but I was- You were in, 12. I was at middle school dances listening to <laughs> no, Swedish dude, House they Mafia. fuck, mm-hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. What's what's the biggest impact Swedish House Mafia has had on your life? Greyhound, the song okay. for cardio. Okay. Nice. Yeah. If you want to like get through a run, listen to Greyhound by Swedish House Mafia. I'm gonna check. I'm gonna check it out. I'm gonna do yeah. it. Love it. Then my last who's back is Bigfoot. There's been pictures of a Bigfoot sighting. I've tracked it down. A lot of states are claiming that the Bigfoot was seen in their state, but I've tracked it down to Ohio. There was some Bama people claiming that they found them in Bama, but I know that this is like getting shared as misinformation. I there definitely is pictures of what looks like a Bigfoot, but I'm not sure exactly. Where the Bigfoot was seen, but you just what said is Ohio. A Bigfoot, you, Billy. Wait, you just is said it Ohio. officially Ohio, so that's a, that's, that's the a first Big Ten post. title. Yeah. yeah, that was the first Hang post the at Ohio. Billy, Hang the banner. Billy's it's, like, there's a lot of misinformation out there, but I just want to correct it and let you know that Bigfoot is currently in Ohio, well, not it's a Alabama. Sa- Sasquatch it looked like a full ground Sasquatch. How mm-hmm. tall? I, I'd probably say six, six to seven feet. And what do you think they eat? I think they eat vegetation. I think they're huge, maybe a little omnivorous fat diet, but mostly heavy greens. That's how gorillas get their mass. Probably some sort of gigantopithecus. But uh, why would they choose Ohio? I feel like there's tons of greenery. All right. Okay. Good highway system. Good enough for me. Yeah. Yep. Might be a Buckeyes fan. Yeah. Anyway, those are my who's backs. Thank you. All right. Good job, Bill. My who's back of the week is respect. <laughs> yes. In finally. the name. Of walking someone with the bases loaded. Oh, yeah. Corey Seager intentionally walked with the bases loaded. The Rangers still won the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, Mike Trout's reaction excuse me, was the, uh, so funny. The Angels. The Angels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mike Trout was like, why are we doing this right It was now? also like the third inning. Yeah, this isn't Barry Bonds. Bottom of the fourth in a 3-2 Bottom game. <laughs> one, one out. <laughs> there was also what I think is the most electric call in sports. The walk-off walk. Yeah. That happened in the Orioles game, right? It was Orioles yeah, Yankees. Yankees. Oh, Aaron Boone managed John's... to get tossed after mm-hmm. the game was over. I love hear John Sterling's call on that. I lo- yeah, Sorry, strike three. Strike. Yeah, <laughs> that's an easy one. I love a walk. And we're going off, extras. Walk-off. People, people <laughs> like the way that the the stadium reacts and the players on the field like jumping up in the air, sprinting out on oh, the field electric. after a walk. Yeah, amazing. And then the umpire always sticks around to make sure he touches home plate. Yep, attention to detail. Yep, you have to. The umpire in that spot. 
is similar to the uh, ref counting threes in the three point contest. But yeah, this is a crazy, there. crazy incident here. I really want to get John Sterling's call. Damn, damn. Can you find it? For I us? can look for it. Yeah. Yeah. He probably was so confused. Like, how can the game end on a walk? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's get to uh, speaking of baseball. Let's get to Jake Carey. Had an awesome interview, uh, and we are have a sponsor before we do yeah want to talk to you guys about our great great friends over at cross country mortgage i love cross country mortgage if you've ever purchased a home you know how tough the process can be if you're still throwing away money on rent every month you're just sitting on the bench cross country mortgage puts you in the game and you'll be a part of a championship team their mortgage has a team of loan officers dedicated to getting you the best possible loan terms available they take all the pain out of the mortgage process, which if you've ever done it, you know how much paperwork's involved, you know how much time is required. They make it super easy. They make it the easiest that it possibly can be. They have an average close time of 21 days. That's ridiculously fast, 21 days. They've got a wide variety of loan types, which means they've got everything to cover everyone. And we have some exciting news. They're giving away free Barstool and Cross Country Mortgage sweatshirts when you sign up to refi or get pre-approval while supplies last. So what are you waiting for? Get off the bench, start warming up. Cross Country Mortgage is the team dedicated to getting you in your dream home. Start winning today. Go to ccm.com slash barstool so Cross Country Mortgage can take care of you through the buying process. Cross Country Mortgage, LLC, NMLS, 3029, all loans subject to underwriting approval, www.nmlsconsumeraccess.org. Now here is Jake Arrieta. Okay, we now welcome on a very special guest. Uh, one of my favorite baseball players of all time. He is a world champion. He's a Cy Young winner. It is Jake Arietta. Jake, uh, thank you for joining us. And I truly mean that. I was. We can get into like my Chris Farley, Paul McCartney type of questions later. Um, yeah. Because I I went through I went down memory lane before this. Um, and yeah, it is like it's going to be Chris Farley, Paul McCartney at some point. But good to see you. Let's. Let's start with this. So you are not pitching right now. Are you? Do you want to announce your retirement? Are you officially retired? Well, I haven't signed the papers, man. But I'm, I'm done. You know, it's, it's, it's time for me to step away from the game. Uh, at some, at some point, the uniform goes to somebody else, and it's just my time, really. You know, what's funny too is Carl texts me, and we're kind of talking a little bit, uh, throwing some ideas around for the, for the future. And I go, man, hey, I, I just signed with the Tokyo Giants. And I get like radio, <laughs> I get radio silence from him. And so I text him a few days later and I go, man, I was just, I was just fucking with you. So uh, <laughs> every, everything's good. You... And then also a, a team in, a team in Mexico, I, I don't remember the name, but they sent me an email and a bunch of texts like, hey, we'd love to have you while you're looking for a job. You know, we've got these guys on the roster. I'm like, dude, I'm not going to Mexico unless I'm drinking pina coladas. Like, yeah. I, I'm not. Uh, you know, it, it is what it is. So yeah, man, I'm uh, uh, I'm done. Okay, so obviously last year didn't go great. Um, we can address that real quick. I I'm very curious. I was happy that you're back with the Cubs. Like I said, you're one of my favorite baseball players of all yeah. time. How was it yeah. though with David Ross as your manager last year, who you played with, and then having to have that difficult conversation? Like, hey, this this might be this might be over. Yeah, you know, having David as a manager was was great look i i don't know if there's anybody else that i'd rather play for um the field general goes out with a, a home run and his last at bat in the world series right like he's he's my guy he's one of my guys so regardless of what has to happen behind the scenes with with my performance or or where the team the team stands like that that's just part that's just part of the job description right it's a difficult i mean we had an we had some emotional moments right like i was i was at a point where i was doing everything i possibly could to to make things work and you know unfortunately and i i came to this realization around the 19 season towards the end of the 19 season the man look my body feels amazing but the show the, the old whip it's just it doesn't rotate the way it used to and whether I like it or not, that's just kind of where things were going, you know, and it got to a point where I just couldn't feel my arm in, in space at release. And it was most dramatic on my, my curveball and my changeup, right? Like I was hitting guys with changeups and, 
and those are two pitches where I could I could throw where I wanted, right? Velocity was not the issue. I was still, you know, 91, 94. I could not physically feel where, where my arm was at at release, you know, and trying to trying to keep it going, trying to provide for for the organization and for a fan base and for, you know, for my teammates, you know, and doing what I did in Chicago before, like it, it sucked to be in that position, you know, to go from warming up before games and hearing the, the, the fans in the stands going nuts and kind of knowing that I was going to dominate. And then last year it's like, Oh, hopefully he gets to the third inning. Right. So it, it sucks. It yeah. did yeah. suck, but, but it is what it is. There's no, there's no script that you, that you can like look at and say, this is how it's going to, how it's going to play itself out. It just, it, it happened that way, unfortunately. Um, but you know, we're, we're here now. It's, it, it's all good. I don't regret anything, you know, uh, Chicago is my city. It always will be. Um, but yeah, would, would I have liked it to go a little bit better? Sure. Of course. I would have liked to see it through, uh, last year, uh, with the boys all year, but Hey man, I had a seven. So what are you going to do? You're not, yeah. you, you know, it, it, it's the way it goes. Yeah, yeah, and at your best, you were – I mean, you were filthy. Actually, we always have this debate on the show when we talk about baseball pitching. Is it better to be filthy, dirty, or nasty? And which one were you? I mean, I was all those. I was all <laughs> – I was all those, man. You know, um, I just really – it really was for a while there. And uh, especially that second half in, in, in 15 um, – I was, I just did a podcast and I was talking about how you go from one start to the next. And like, I would forget the one before because it's, it's over. Right. Like I was so focused on not the numbers, but just like getting 27 outs. Like that was literally what I thought every time I took the mound is I'm getting 27 outs and um, everything clicked. Not, I mean, the stuff was always there. Right. Like when I was in Baltimore, I was 93, 98 with, with, all the movement just without the command right so being able to like kind of put it all together uh having having the mound presence the demeanor uh the the filthy stuff the dirty stuff the nasty stuff and then also the command of it right mm -hmm. it just all kind of clicked and you know for three or four years there you know things went pretty well so i i don't know that much about you personally uh but from what i've gathered watching you pitch you seem like a guy that um on game day you're a psycho you turn into an absolute like okay you know like max scherzer kind of has that vibe where um you know when, when it's not his day to pitch he's the nicest guy people hang out with him shoot the shit whatever on game day absolutely dialed in uh which is that a fair way to describe you yeah, I think, you know, once it got to about an hour before the game, I wasn't really the easiest guy to talk to. And it wasn't because, you know, I didn't like you or I didn't want to have conversation. Like, these were in, right? AirPods were in or headphones were on. And I was just going through my routine. And, like, I just wanted to beat you so bad that, like, I, I didn't have time to even say hi to you, right? Like, and – from the outside looking in, I talk to guys about this all the time. Like when we, they would play against me, like, Oh, like you seem like a dick or like, you're just not, you're not a nice guy. Like you said with Max, couldn't be further from the truth. Love Max. Right. But like, there's something about those, the highest level of competitors that whether you're pitching against somebody you don't know, or your best friend, it doesn't matter. Like I'm doing anything in my power to beat you. And then afterwards, hey, let's we'll grab a beer. That's like whatever, wh however it plays itself out. But there's a place that certain guys go to to kind of dial everything in, maintain that focus from start to finish. Because I was I was guilty of this early in my career, having having pretty good focus, but having that lapse in in, in concentration, even even if it was briefly, right, just for a brief moment. Next thing you know, you give up four runs, right, and that's that's a you know um that's giving credit to the opponent right they make a lot of money too they're really good so if you have that lapse in focus even for for a little bit of time 
you risk getting your ass kicked, right? So that's that's kind of why I was always dialed in the way I was. So between the you know those Cubs teams when it was uh, you Lester, and there was also a year or two when when Lackey was on the team. Who was yep. who was most like don't fuck with that guy before a start because I would actually as as psycho as you've seen before a start I'd still probably put my money on John Lackey because he's just a scary dude but those are three dudes that yeah. like you don't want to fuck with before they while they're on the mound and also before they're on the mound man that's it's funny because you're you're, you're spot on with with Lack yeah. but I mean. It couldn't be further from the truth. Like if you if you actually hang around him, he's the biggest goddamn teddy bear on the planet, right? Uh, I, I I mess with him all the time, and and less less to the same way. But on game day, you're you're right though. Like in in Lackey would always say this. He's like, I wasn't good enough to not go to that place, right? He's like, I didn't have the ninety seven to one hundred, right? I like I was just. He's like, I'm a normal white guy with decent stuff and I throw strikes. So I had to be that like asshole kind of, kind of vibe right on game day. But uh, I mean, Lester had a little bit of that in him too, right? Like if he, if he had a rough, rough inning or something like that, you didn't want to be in the way as he's coming down the steps. Yeah. Yeah. W what about uh, like the umpire interactions that you guys would have? Because that was another thing with Lackey. I always thought that he would, he would have certain games where he would like, almost bully the ump to be like, Hey, this is what you're going to call. Would you, would you feel like you'd be able to do that? Like once you establish, establish yourself as a premier pitcher, did you think that maybe the umps gave you more respect or, you know, explain things better in between innings? I think lackey had the shortest leash with umpires. Lester was probably two. I was, I was three. I gave, I would typically give the umpire like two or three before I started chirping at all. Yeah. But I, I, I wouldn't say anything. And then when I would, I would like scream at them. <laughs> like, you know, just say, Hey, like I've given you three or four, like you need to figure it out, you know? And, and when you would do that, you would notice that the umpires would typically let that slide. Right. Because they know when they, they miss some pitches. Right. Like if the guy, I understand if the guy's setting up a foot off the plate, you hit the glove, like that's a ball, right? But if I'm if I'm in the zone, I'm hitting the glove repetitively and you keep missing the same pitch, then I have to say something, right? And it's it's not to be disrespectful. It's like, hey, I'm I'm working my ass off out here. This is not easy. Like if I execute in the strike zone, you got to raise the right hand. Like that's, that's kind of what it came down to. I mean, John would... John would, uh, I mean, from the get-go, right? And <laughs> I think he, he had several of these moments, but he's like, you know, if you miss, you can't miss the first pitch of the game as the umpire. Like, what, <laughs> where are you at? You know what I mean? Like, first pitch of the game, you're going you're gonna to ball me on a, on a ball down away? So, uh, Lackey, shortest leash, Lester, second. Me, I, I think I, I gave him a, a little bit more leeway. Yeah, I used to love watching Lester pitch. It, it always it boggled my mind, but it was also kind of funny to watch from an outside perspective um, when he would try to throw the ball to first base, whether it was on like a comeback to the pitcher or if it was a, a pickoff attempt. I have to assume that you guys, you know, like spring training, you work on that sort of thing. Would he be able to do it in spring training? Man, he would. Like, he would go out there, you know, we would say we'd stretch it. 8.30, 9 o'clock, he'd go out there with one of our infield guys or one of the pitching coaches. And I mean, even Rizzo would go out there with him, bucket of balls, work on throwing the ball to first base. Um, just one of those things, man. He he did not like throwing the ball over there. And I'll kind of equate it to, like, me trying to throw BP to my son's team, like, last year and the year before when they're, like, just starting to be able to uh, you know, hit a little bit, right? But I can't throw slow. <laughs> and it's, a, it's, a, it's the same thing like did I just a real quick story my son's last game of, of coach pitch we lost because I struck five guys out and I hit three so <laughs> because on, like, doing, like trying to and you know what um, and the parents on the other team are like who is this guy yeah. like well, why are you letting this coach throw you know but it's one of those deals where it's just we're not used to lobbing the ball right and so it's did, just wait, one of those things. To go back to the to the little league thing. Like you're only pitching yeah. to your son's team, 
And then this is the, the son's team. Then the dad of the opposing team or whatever is a guy that probably didn't win a Cy Young. <laughs> No, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think was, there, one. was there any of the five strikeouts that felt good? Because I feel like there's probably one kid that you were like, I don't really like, you know, like that felt good. Like that, I put that pitch perfect. That that was you a know, good strikeout. Hundred hundred percent. Now that you mention it, it wasn't even it wasn't even necessarily where the pitch was. Just maybe the kid was like a little shit, you know. Yeah, so like, so you 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 get you get five pitches, right? So. Um, Whatever, whatever the result is, like, okay, all right, um, okay, that's three pitches. I get two more. Jesus, throw one of these down the middle so the kid can hit it. <laughs> no, I missed. Okay, this is the last pitch. This is a lot of pressure. There's a lot of people watching. And I hit him. Like, oh, my God. <laughs> all right. Well, you know what? That's it. And when you get hit, you don't get to go to first. Like, you just go back to the dugout. So it's even it's even worse. <laughs> that's Jesus. so fucking funny. You know? That's messed oh, up. Oh, yeah. So, like, uh, and look. Love, love Lester Death, yeah. uh, one of my guys. I don't understand why more people didn't steal off him. I know. Mm-hmm. It was I mean, kind some, of like out of respect. Sometimes they would yeah. take like 10, 15 foot leads knowing that there was nothing. My favorite thing that he yeah. ever did, you remember when he like threw his entire glove yes. to first base? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the ball. ball was, well, the, the ball was actually stuck in his web on that one. Yeah. <laughs> but then he did have a, he picked a guy off at least once or twice where, he just bounced it to first, and, yeah. and got, I think it was against the Cardinals. It might have been like Tommy Family and off or something like that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, guys sometimes have that. I've seen it with people in the past that just physically can't do it unless they're throwing it at max effort. That's 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 incredible. So all right, so I'm gonna do my Chris Farley thing because uh, obviously I was a huge fan. I was at a bunch of these games because I had season tickets. But so for people to do, who don't know the context here. Jake had a stretch, a five-month stretch from 2015 to 2016. I looked it back up, and I was like, even looking it back up, even though I lived it, I was like, holy fuck. You went 26-1 and one in 28 starts. You had The only loss that you had was when the Cubs got no hit for the first, e- first time in 50 years. Literally <laughs> yeah. the only time yeah. that Jake Arrieta mm-hmm. lost a game was because the Cubs got no hit in fi- first time in 50 years. You had two no-hitters in that stretch. You had 162 and a third innings pitched, 26 earned runs, and 200 strikeouts. I like that for my money. I I remember like going to I I the one memory I have that's very vivid is the 20th win that season in 2015 against the Brewers when you pitched nine innings shutout, and it was like this feeling that every time you started, it was a legitimate question: Will he get a no hitter? And I I have to ask like. Did you – was that just the coolest feeling in the world to get up there being like, I know there is nothing these guys can do to touch me? That was a mindset, and it, and it was – yeah. I mean, the best part about that is what I was able to – you know, because we were, we were progressing to becoming, you know, that World Series contending team, right? And when I got there in 13 – you know, it was still just like a team full of, uh, you know, some one year deal guys, young players, the revolving door 14. You know, I think I had like a two, four, two, five ERA. I had a real nice season. And then we had some draft picks that were ready in 15. We signed, we signed Lester. Um, then it was like, holy shit. Like we got Schwarber. We had, um, Addison Russell. We had Chris Bryant. We had Javi. It's like, damn, and they're all ready to go now. That's that's one of the rarities of it, you know, and you give Theo credit and the and the rest of the front office for drafting so damn well to get this group of guys ready at the same time, right? Crazy. But, yeah, man, like I just – the delivery was was on point. The the he- health, obviously, was, was paramount, right, just being able to go out there every five days. And – Every time I went out there, it just led to more confidence. Like each and every time I went out there, like you said, I expected to get 27 outs or I expected to at least be in the eighth inning, right? With, with the team having the lead, you know? And um, yeah, it's, and I, a lot of it was a blur. And I think that's, that's because I was only focused on my next start. Right. And then once that start was was passed, doesn't matter anymore. Now we got to do this. 
right? And I wanted I wanted so bad to be a part of the group of guys that erased that 108 year you know drought. We all did, right? And all being being able to provide something unique to that team. And this is something I mentioned uh, in the podcast I just did. We had the same starting five all year. Like how many times has that ever happened, right? Like I, I'm, I'm sure it's, it's probably happened maybe like decades ago, but can you remember back to another team that had the same starting five from, from the end of spring training to throughout the World Series? Yeah, it, it, like was, I, it was crazy. It was the whole thing. The ride, and like you said, the the fourteen season led into the fifteen season. I don't know if you remember this moment. I've told it before, but um, I was lucky enough to hang out with you guys during that. After you guys had clinched, we were at uh, Country Club, and it was before yep. the the Pirates wild card game. And I was like, I'm kind of nervous. And you looked me dead in the eye, and you're like, We're winning that game. You, and then you went out and pitched nine inning shutout, and that was like Man, how locked yeah. in you were. You looked me. I was so scared when you looked me in my eyes. I was like, you had a glass of wine, and you're just like, we're winning that game. I'm not. We're we're winning that game. And so that's that's a fun story too, man. And it kind of goes a little bit a little bit further. So we're on the flight to Pittsburgh, and you know, there's guys that guys are nervous. I know I'm pitching the game, and me and Dex start you know, start talking and, um, you know, he's like, oh, it's a big game and the nerves are kind of there. And I told him, I said, get me one run. Right. That's all I said. I said, you give me one run, we win the game. And kind of same thing that, that, you know, I told you, I'm kind of walking up and down, you know, the rows of the plane. I think I had it, you know, I think I had a beer in my hand and just telling everybody the same thing because I knew I knew people were nervous right like no I I got you we we get one run the game's over and sure enough Schwarber goes out there and hits a leadoff homer yeah right like and then that was and then you know Dex came up to me and I I go hey that's it it's game mm -hmm. game's over and Schwarber so, in the, I, I've heard the story that Schwarber went in the tunnel after he hit that home run and just screamed to himself suck my dick Pittsburgh and oh, he does that. That's that's his thing, man. And he, uh, I mean, he did the same thing. Um, shit, game, uh, one of those games in Cleveland, right? Like, he's just screaming it on first base, right? That's, <laughs> you know, and it would be it would have been awesome to have that same group uh, forever in Chicago. But, I mean, how do you not love Schwarber? He's, and I tell the, boy, the boys in Philly, like, a lot of, like, Miles Teller is a good friend of mine. He's like, hey, what do you got on Schwarber? I go, I go, bro, you guys couldn't have signed a better guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, if you like a leadoff hitter that's going to hit you 40 home runs, you know, in, in, in front of Harper, and that's that's a nice lineup, by the way. Yeah, yeah so, it is. Yeah. And Kyle, that's a nice lineup. Yeah, he, Schwarber's one of those guys. We're lucky enough to meet a lot of guys, but he's one of those guys I've gotten to know, and it's like I genuinely just root for him no matter – like, he could be on any team. Even maybe yeah. even the Cardinals, I might even still root for him personally, which is saying he's a lot. Easy to, yeah, he's easy to root for, man, and he's just like he fits in anywhere. Uh, he's just he's just a baseball guy. You want him on the team. He's good in the clubhouse. He's funny on the flights. Like he's just he's just one of those guys, right? So wherever he goes, like you said, it's he's easy to root for. There's also something uh, that's just awesome about kind of a, a big boy mashing taters, just like smashing. Oh, he's, dunks, yeah, right? he's thick, man. <laughs> he's thick. Yeah, and he moves deceptively quick too for his size. He's, yeah, like he's pretty athletic. He's like a, yeah. Yeah. He is. He is. He's like a propane tank with ears. Yeah. <laughs> He's I, I. The other story I tell. I don't know if I've said this one. I. You might have been there too. I was. Uh, like I said, I was very, very lucky to be able to hang out with you guys during those years. But it was. I think it was Rizzo's event, and we all went out to dinner. And Schwarber was eating a salad, and he was just like, "Fucking Theo says I got to lose fifteen pounds." And he was like, "I've never seen someone so sad about having to eat a salad at a steakhouse." And that was like. It, you could feel it. It was great. It was like that's you're a dude. You're just a guy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he he's gone through those little periods where you know he had he had the knee, uh, the knee happened in sixteen, and I mean he busted his ass like like I've never seen before to get. I mean to come back right like the way he did, and you know we had a uh, you know Josh Cat was the. Uh, was the owner of a company called Kitch Fix. And I think that they're probably still still big in Chicago, but he would, you know, we kind of fuck with Schwarber, but 
they would always put like this big bag of pre-made meals on his chair, right? Like this is, <laughs> this is what you have to eat, whatever. But, um, I think, I think he's going to rake either way. Yeah. Whether he weighs 220, 240, it don't matter. He's going to hit. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember talking to him, uh, when we went down to spring training one year and he was talking about his, his prep and how he came back from the knee injury. And part of that mm-hmm. process was he just went out, stood in the batter's box while they had a pitching machine fi- fire 100 mile an hour fastballs. And he just stood there for hours on end, tracking, Watch, tracking it with his eyes, not even swinging. That's the most psycho shit I think I've ever heard. Like just, just well, being, yeah, it's almost like that, a meditative state that you put yourself into. That's one of those little things that you hear like a great player do that you're like, oh shit, like why didn't we ever think about that, right? But that's how that's how you put in you put in the work and you, and you and you get those those reps in you know when you have a torn ACL right so fuck more more power to him for doing that and it obviously paid off and yeah he was not not only a huge uh, contributor contributor I mean during that run but in in the years that came after that and you know you just look what he's done in any lineup that he that he's going to hit it right mm-hmm. he's um, a guy a guy that can that can hit lead off and, and do that sort of damage. You, you don't, you don't see it everywhere. Yeah. We yeah. had him for like six months in DC and I was so happy to be rooting. Hit for like a hundred home runs yeah, was, that one weekend. It was awesome. Um, so yeah. yeah. So let's talk about baseball today. Um, Cause now you're on the other side. Who's your favorite pitcher to watch and why? Oh, I mean, it's such an easy question. If everybody on the planet doesn't say Jacob DeGrom, I mean, they're not like, have it, you know what I'm saying? Like, I've told people this for a couple of years. I think he's the best starting pitcher to ever put on the uniform. Wow. And I, I, if he can stay healthy, right. And I, I hope, you know, him and Scherzer are, are on the IL currently still correct. Yeah. Which I, is such, such a shame. Like I think Scherzer's game off, need, right? Yeah. Scherzer, Scherzer might be off? back, but okay. DeGrom is. Yeah. So our, our game needs both of those guys, but most importantly, DeGrom. I mean, he's just, if you get to watch him in person, just what he's able to do with the baseball and what, where he, and when he came into the big leagues, was it 2013 or something like that? Yeah. So he, his average fastball velocity was around 93, maybe a tick over. It's gone steadily up since then. And now he's sitting 99, like averaging, like it's just, it, it blows you away to see what he can do as a starting pitcher. So I think he's just, I think he's in his own league, right? Um, and I, I hope he stays healthy for another 15 years because I, if, if he can do that, I think he'll be the best ever. Day. Yeah. yeah. I, I saw him live last year. Uh, I bet the over on, on the game. And I think that, yeah. that was the game where we went out there and struck out like 16 people against the nationals. <laughs> it was the most oh, dominating performance I've ever seen from a pitcher it's absurd. And at some point halfway through. I just, I said, you know what? Fuck it. I'm, I'm here to, to apply greatness. And it was, it was awesome yeah. to see. It's it's a thing of beauty, man. I mean, to to watch a starting pitcher not only command the baseball, have the mound presence, but to to do it at that that type of velocity, right? I mean, he throws ninety eight to one hundred two, you know, mm-hmm. and and what the catcher's glove, it's like it's there at one hundred two, which is just a wild a wild thing to 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 witness in person, and to watch him do it for a hundred and something pitches and to also hear that now that his mechanics are as refined as they've ever been like that's a scary proposition so look i i i wish him all the health i hope i hope uh he gets back out there as soon as possible because man i just i love seeing it we're going to get back to jake arietta in a second before we do hello fresh is here to tell you about their pre-proportioned ingredients to your door so you can get convenience without skimping on quality Skip the trip to the grocery store and don't waste money on excess food. If you found yourself in a new workout program, maybe you're working out every day, letting your friends and family know that you've just completed another workout, you're looking for nutritious, fast, easy-to-use meals that will give you all the protein that you need, and they're delicious. That's the thing about HelloFresh. It's not just a normal meal delivery service, food prep service. It's actually good food. You can pick your favorites from 50 different weekly options and skip weeks when you need to. So they're very flexible. You can change your delivery date. You can update your preferences all in the HelloFresh app. I use HelloFresh. It is delicious food. They've got pasta primavera. They've got salmon limon. They've got all kinds of gourmet meals, and they're easy to prep as well. 
You can add proteins to the veggie meals. You can swap out one protein or side for another. You can customize everything, and you can upgrade. So you get more choices, more variety, more meals truly tailored to you. HelloFresh will save you time, save you money, and make things very easy, very fast. Plus, cooking can be a great way to unwind at the end of the day, and their cooking is quick enough where it's not going to take up your entire evening. Go to HelloFresh.com slash PMT16. Use code PMT16 and get up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. That's HelloFresh.com slash PMT16. Use promo code PMT16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. Now here's more Jake Arietta. I've got a hypothetical for you because we I think we talked about um, what it would be like if an average person faced off against Jacob DeGrom. I'm not going to ask you that, but I will ask you at the, at the peak of your career, so we're talking like late 2015, um, if I stepped into the batter's box against you and I had you throw 100 pitches, do you think I could lay down a bunt? No. Not even a bunt? Uh, a, a, a bunt fair. Yeah, fair right? bunt. Yeah. I, I mean, not no. like reach for a space, but just make contact. No, the ball there's fair territory. No, there's just so many things that I would do. Like I'd throw you like high sinkers at your hands that it probably foul off your fist into your face. <laughs> I would, th- you know, I would, I would throw you like, I'd throw you the, what you probably couldn't get the curveball down either, but that would probably be your best bet. Right. To throw you a low curveball and just kind of, kind of throw the bat at it. I, I don't, I don't think so, man. I think if I you really threw me don't. a curveball, I would, I would bail out of the box every time you could throw me a hundred straight curveballs. That would start coming at me, and I would never learn my life. I would just bail out. It's a hard thing to do. I, you know, and Eric, my buddy, we just did a podcast. He goes, well, how, how long do you have to react? You know, is it like a second or a little more than a second? I go, dude, it's like a ten- two-tenths of a second. Right. Right. Like by the time you, you think you're going to swing, it's already too late. And that's why I told him, like, it's that, it's that much more impressive with what hitters are able to do with the velocity where it is in the game today. Because you almost have, like, out of hand, you're either swinging or you're not. Yeah. You know, it's just, All right, so I don't know. Another <laughs> hypothetical, uh, reverse yeah. it. You won Silver Slugger in uh, 2016 as a pitcher. Yeah. You hit, like, 262. If you were able to, to bat all year, do you, what would your average in, and numbers look like? That's a good question. Um, not getting consistent at bats is hard, right? Um you're hitting once every five days, still working on it in between. So you want to think that your numbers would maybe go up a little bit or stay around the same and have a little bit more power, but then you're just facing so many more arms, right? Um, There's so many more opportunities for, you know, for failure. Even you go through periods where you're hitting the ball hard and you're still getting out. So it might sound like the right answer to say my numbers would, would be where they're at or higher. I, I just think I'd get honestly with y'all, I think I'd get exposed a little bit more. Well, right. Because look, yeah, because I can, I can, I could hit the fastball. Like I, I was ready to hit the fastball all at all times. But if you got ahead of me, if you throw anything that resembled a strike, I'm still swinging at it. <laughs> like that's, that's why it's so much more impressive to see guys you know, they're, you know, it's a one, two, Oh, two count and you throw this bastard curveball. And it's like, how do you not even flinch? Right. So I'm pretty sure the numbers would have, would have gone down in a full season. So, so from a pitcher's perspective, like, and could you feel it when you're in the batter's box, would the pitcher take a little off, like take a rest almost when the, when the pitcher position comes up in the NL? Because I always felt like that would be when a lot of the hits happen where it's like, Oh, maybe they're not, you know, throwing their absolute best stuff. They're taking not a break, but it's a different mentality than going up against Mike Trout when you're going up against a pitcher. Would you would you feel that happen from time to time? With cer- with certain guys. And from experience, um, you know, ninety percent of the pitchers that step in the box, it's like, all right, I'm I'm throwing I'm throwing a four seam right down the middle, right? Right. But when you have like uh, you have Adam Wainwright, you have DeGrom, you have Syndergaard, you have Scherzer, you have Grinke, you have Bumgarner. When you have certain guys, certain pit, you just know the guys that can that can swing it, right? And if if I'm if I'm going to be a dumbass and throw Grinke like 93 down the middle, he's going to put a nice swing on it. Is it gu- a guaranteed hit? No, but I'm I'm doing him a favor. And I feel like guys were the same way with me, right? Like 
the guys knew I could hit and guys knew I could hit the ball a long way. So a lot of the times I would get like a first pitch slider, uh, which is a fucking terrific pitch to throw me first pitch. Um, you know, and if you, if I got into a two Oh count and you threw a fastball, like it, it better be in like a decent spot, like, but that doesn't mean I'm going to hit over the fence. It just means I'm going to put a really good swing on. Yeah. I, I think maybe my favorite career highlight of yours is when you were batting. It's not even uh, a start that you had or a particular pitch that you threw. You stepped in the box against Madison Bumgarner and you put a shot out into left field and it's like a sea of black and, and orange out there, except for the dude that caught the ball. He's the yeah, only Cubs wild. fan in the entire stadium, and he hit it like directly into his glove. It was awesome. Can you walk me through like that at bat and how awesome it feels as a pitcher to hit a home run off a great pitcher like Madison? Bumgarner? Yeah, yeah. I mean, really cool story. Uh, you know, we're on the road, obviously playing San Francisco and and trying to trying to move past them to get to the. Uh, to the NLCS, and at the time, Bumgarner had been, you know, he had like 20 scoreless innings in the postseason or something. Like, he was – that was kind of during his run of being like, you know, this this titan in the postseason and just kind of bulldog and hard to beat, right? So, it was a, it was a pretty exceptional game, and he kept throwing me up and in, right, which is from the left side, he's kind of slinging it over here, and it's kind of coming across the plate. Uh, I think he threw me two up there. I think I swung a miss and I took one for a ball. He went like, uh, might've thrown an off speed. I mean, like, I got two strikes. He's definitely, he's coming up and in again. Right. So I sold out to the up and in, if he would have thrown anything middle away, I mean, I'm walking back to the dugout. Right. But I happened to guess, right. Put a good swing on it. And off the bat, I'm like, shit, that's going to either. I th It seemed to me like it had a little bit of top spin. I caught it. I caught it pretty clean, but it was kind of a line drive. And so if you see when I'm running around first base, the ball had just gotten over the wall and I'm kind of getting after it to, to get on second base for a double. And I, I see it's out. I go to high five Brandon Hyde and he almost like spins me around, right? And like a corkscrew and I almost say shit. But uh, my favorite reaction was Riz in the dugout, just kind of seeing it on replay, his reaction. Um, and then Dempster told me he was sitting in the stands in the, during that game and he said he just kept screaming, the Russians cut, the Russians been cut, right? Because, because you know, uh, at the time, Bumgarner hadn't given up shit in the postseason, you know, uh -huh. for a while. So really cool moment. Um, but, yeah, I've got, I've got some cool moments uh, as a hitting pitcher. One, one I'll tell you real quick. So in 20 uh, – this might have been 2016. We're in Arizona. All the starting pitchers throwing like five grand. Whoever hits the first homer, the other pitchers buy him a watch, right? So I think Lester started game one. I started game two. I'm facing Shelby Miller. First at bat of the year, I hit a homer dead center, right? <laughs> so I won I won the watch bet very, very first, very first at bat of the year. And Lester, like, oh, you gotta be shitting me. First at bat of the year? Like, I mean, they were they were they were pissed, right? But mm -hmm. that I think that's that's a pretty cool one too. We have that that's same great. bet here at part of my take. First First you guy should. that hits well, major league. First guy to bench that. Yeah. First guy that can bench that. <laughs> yes. Me. Yes. Who's the uh, Who's the hardest guy to get out right now in in major league baseball, or maybe even if you're your top three hitters that you're like those guys, they do something different than everyone else, where it's just a completely different beast when you're when you're oh, facing them. Top three right now. Okay. Um, Soto. Yep. And the, some of this, some of this is from nightmares from from personal experience with these guys. So Soto, just I mean, he's twenty one years old or twenty, and just the the advanced knowledge of the strike zone to go along with his ability as a hitter um, is amazing. Again, hopefully he stays healthy and plays this game for a long time. Is good for the game. Uh, Ronald Acuna uh, has to be in there. Um, Again, hopefully he can stay healthy. Awesome that he's he's back from that uh, uh, that injury. That that injury was awful in uh, in Miami. Um, those two guys are phenomenal. Who else, man? Um, uh, let's go. Let's go down the teams. Where we got here? I mean, and when he's healthy, I mean, uh, Fernando Tatis. Yeah, like when he, when he's when he's dialed in, like. 
he's going to the opposite field. You miss with spin inside part of the plate. He's taking you to left or left center for a homer. Uh, good strikes on judgment. So, I mean, I think those are, those are three good ones right there, but yeah. yeah, I mean, I could, I could probably come up with a few more, but those are, those, those three are tough. Was there any dude that you pitched against that might not have been like a superstar or a name that we would first think of when we're thinking of, of the great hitters of like the mid two thousands or, uh, or the teens that for some reason had your number, like one guy that was a thorn in your side. Uh, there are guys like that, man. Um, I'm trying to think early in my career in Chicago. And then, uh, well, I mean, look, Joey Votto, obviously he's, he's way high on the list, but I, I could never really get him out. I got him out of like maybe, you know, three times in that no hitter in, in, in Cincinnati, but guy just got hits. Uh, I gave up and look, I love Eric Sogard. But I give a grand slam to Eric Sogard early in my career. Okay, that that to me, um, that sticks with me, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, I think, 2010, 2011. Wait, when you uh, say that else? sticks with you, like how often does it pop in your head? Uh, when I'm telling stories like my little league team, and they're asking, <laughs> you know, they they think they think that like you're always like elite and just like the best there ever was. I'm like, dude, no, like I. I give up. I give up a grand slam to a nine hole hitter, right? Um, <laughs> and it, you know, uh, it, it, more than more than it should. Right, you know? right. I'm, I'm gonna I love that. I'm gonna, yeah, and I'm gonna text Sogi right now. You son of a bitch. Uh, <laughs> He's like, I'm uh, thinking about that grand slam. <laughs> no, there. I'd have to look back, man. But there, there are definitely guys that would hit in that like you know seven to nine spot that I just couldn't get out, right? And some of it, some of it early in the career is just kind of lack of focus. You get through the first five, six guys, and you're like, "Oh, I got them," and then you give up. You know, you give up three or four runs. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, get a get a headline grab going. One way that every uh, like it's always good to drum up some sort of headline when uh, when players talk about the shift for whatever reason. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts on the shift? Are we banning the shift? Uh, all right. Well. This is a tough. This is a tough one because if you talk, you know, you talk to guys like Rizzo, or you talk to hitters that only hit the ball to the pull side, they get pissed, right? They they don't want the shift, and I, I I hate to say that I kind of understand it, but at the same time, and Rizzo Rizzo has been good. Like when he's when he's behind the count, he'll go to the opposite field. Yeah, like he'll 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 hit those little line drives, like in front of the left fielder. He'll take his base hits. Like what happened to what happened to that? What happened to so focusing on being as well-rounded of a hitter as you can, I well, let me answer my own question. I think that some of it is this advanced analytics and these guys just telling them to to be one-dimensional. Like, we want you to hit for power and continue to try and hit for power regardless, right? Yeah. But, I mean, runs, runs come at a premium sometimes, right? Like, it's not just guaranteed that you're going to score five or six runs in any given game, right? Like I've been part of teams that went through stretches where they scored one or two runs in the course of four or five games. So if, if I can, if I can get some production, you know, even if it's a, if, if it's a base hit to the opposite field, then that puts the starting pitcher in the stretch, right? Things can happen. Pass ball. We, manufacturing runs shouldn't be a lost art, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I understand the argument for, banning the shift but i also don't like the idea of having the greatest product in the world the high, the greatest product of the sport in the world the highest level of the sport telling guys that they no longer need to learn how to be multi-dimensional as a as a hitter you know so and look i'm not i'm not dead set on that i love having the argument i love listening to guys kind of discuss why it should or shouldn't be done and and you know, but I, I don't love it. Yeah, I, I don't yeah. love the shifting band. I really don't. What do you think? What do you guys? Yeah, I, I agree with you. Like beat the shift. Yeah, beat the shift. Let's There's lay, I, down, I, lay down a bunt. Yeah, I remember Why Rizzo not? once laid down a bunt to that side, and it's like, and, and like you said, if you can beat the shift with an easy single to the opposite field, then you can't shift the next batter. You know what I mean? With a guy on base, so everything kind of yeah. changes. So I, yeah, I, I'm with you. I think that it's it's gamesmanship. And teams should – guys should learn how to beat the shift, and then they won't – shift because, like, that's the thing is all these things are numbers-based. 
And as soon as a guy can prove that he can hit it the other way, they won't shift him. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. And I've seen you see Freddie Freeman drop it down. I'm you've seen a lot of guys. You know, I think that we've seen Max Muncy do it, right? Like, if you're going to leave that entire side of the field open, Bryce Harper's done it, right? Like, guys will do it. So, maybe they just need – we need to do it more often. But then you sacrifice, okay, your biggest thump in the lineup, potentially, like being on first base. So, I I see that. But there are a lot – there are a bunch of lineups in the game right now that – aren't just provided power by from one or two guys. Yeah. Right? Like, there's a lot of guys who can leave the ballpark with, with one swing of the bat. So, and getting guys on base is, it's a big deal for, for more pitchers than you think, right? A lot of guys don't like to throw out of the stretch. And you would think at that level, it's just, it's just kind of part of the game, whether you're in the windup or the stretch, but – the guy on first base or second base can fuck with them, right? And if the guy gets a second base, now you have to deal with mixing in different sets of signs. And, uh, you know, or if he's not stealing your signs, he can see the grip in your glove. And then you change, like, the way you position your hands. Like, there's way more variables that come to play than you think. So getting a guy on base, it does more than just, you know, create a, a situation where you that, that will lead to runs, right? It puts more pressure on the pitcher. Yeah, and that's on, yeah, that's interesting. And on the outfield too, and on the infield, like everything, All of it, everything of changes course. up. The small adjustments. I actually think so. Yeah, home runs are fun. I love home runs. It's awesome to watch. Our producer Bubba has a thing like a kink where he just sits down and watches YouTube compilations of monster shots, which is awesome. I get that, but you know what? Small ball is fun. I think small ball is fun when you get like guys stealing bases and you get like manufacturing runs, like you were talking about. That, to me, is right. why I started watching baseball and what I loved when I was a kid. Yeah, it's one of those intricacies of the game that makes it um, – one, it it requires, like, a, a another level of knowledge to understand that, right? Like, if you're just, like, a, a common fan of the game, like, yeah, you expect to see home runs and you expect to see 100 miles an hour and, and all that stuff. But, like, if you really love the game – you understand like the complexity of it and you appreciate the complexity of it. Right. Like, um, gaining, gaining an extra 90 feet, right. Like is, is incredibly important. Whether that, if that guy can move from first base just to second base, there's so many more things that have to be done now with that guy there. Right. If this guy and, and, and think about the play at the plate on a base hit, if this guy, if as a pitcher, if I can't keep this guy somewhat close to the bag, right? If I allow his lead just to get a little bit too far out there, that's the difference between him being safer out at the plate, right? So there's so many things that have to happen. Um, and especially if you have a young pitcher on the mound, you want to expose that, right? Whether he has, he has you know, a, a great demeanor or mound presence or not, like things speed up when guys get on base. Yeah. So – that's something that you know can't go overlooked. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, all right. So this has been awesome, Jake. We appreciate it. I had one last question. It's the rowback question. You take twenty percent off uh, your first purchase with uh, the code take at r h o b a c k dot com. Twenty percent off your first purchase. The rowback question. Uh, so w- you you played in Major League Baseball for a very long time. Can you give me the top three cities that the team would be most excited to go visit? Top three cities that you'd be like, whether it be the actual field, the or the, the you know maybe the clubhouse or the actual city in terms of eating options. What are the top three that everyone was? And also, side question: uh, Did you believe that there were ghosts in the Fister Hotel in Milwaukee? I never saw one. We you actually know, had wow. a ghost hunter find them. We stayed in well, there. Well, okay. Yeah. Oh, with that with that show, those guys from that show. No, we just hired yeah, someone. Just, it was oh, on Craigslist. Okay, okay. I just remember VJ, who who you know obviously very well, used to Love say him. that like yeah, half. Shout out to VJ. Ha, shout out VJ, the man. He said that like half the Cubs wouldn't stay there. Ah, uh, man, I like if there if there are ghosts, like I, I want to see them. I'm you know <laughs> yes. I like to yes. see. Yes, you know what? Uh, I, I think I, the, I whole, the whole deal with the Fister was the wallpaper was so shitty and old that when it's you a say weird it, place. yeah, you yeah, say a place is. like that, the wallpaper makes you think. It reminds you of like old horror movies from yes. the seventies. No doubt, yes. no hundred, hundred percent. And you know what? The Vinoy in Tampa is kind of, kind of got a similar vibe, right? Oh, it's, okay. I don't know if you guys have been there. Yeah, so we would know. stay there when we play the Rays. So, good question. Um, 
maybe not necessarily in any particular order. Obviously, Chicago's number one, let's be honest. Uh, you guys are familiar with that city. I love San Francisco. It, it's kind of gotten a little weird, you know, over the past couple of years. But, I mean, the food, the people watching, being, being close to the water. Uh, uh, a good friend of mine, Mark Bright, owns a restaurant called Angler that is right there off of the water, not far from, from the ballpark. It's a, it's a must-go. Last time I was there, it was me, Rizzo, Tommy LaStella, and Ian Happ, and we had like this like 20-pound, like huge crab, right? And they tell me, I'm like, hey, well, how much is that? They're like, um, I think it's – this crab is probably like 200 bucks. I'm like, all right, yeah, great, great. And then uh, the bill comes. It's like a $500 crab. I mean, if you're off by – and it was fine. We still loved it. But like off by three hundred bucks, like that's 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 a lot. That's a lot. I mean, we whatever. But San Fran's cool. I love the ballpark, um, and just walking around early, like being kind of elevated in the, in the stands and looking out at the at the bay. Really cool place. Um, I haven't been to Toronto in, in quite a while, but I've always loved that city. Yep. Um, the ballpark is just that, but. I mean, the, the city's the city's great, especially if you're there kind of in, in the late spring. The golf is phenomenal. Uh, stand down near the water. Uh, I think it's Harbor 60 is the name of the restaurant. One of the best in the world. Uh, number three, let's see. Um, uh, and look, I'm not a giant fan of New York, but I love to go for like three or four day stretches. Yeah, it's a perfect right? city to do that. Man. I yeah. love I love to go there for three or four days. I like to like to bounce around, grab a coffee, grab a juice, and just go for a walk, man. Whether it's through Central Park or going down to Soho, um, you know, you can spend a lot of money there, which is fine. And uh, I, I love playing in City Field. Obviously, Yankee Stadium is great. Uh, yeah, so those, those three are great. Those are good answers. Mm -hmm. Those are good answers. Well, we, we really appreciate you coming on, and also a special thank you. I, I, I know you probably – it was like a blip for you, but when you decided in 2015 that uh, the shirt that I made, the We Are Good shirt, was going to be your warm-up shirt for every single game, um, that was yes, huge. Sir. That was huge. And then there was a day where I was out in the bleachers because I had season tickets in the bleachers, and um, I think there was like – Probably like seventy percent of the bleachers was wearing that shirt, and I think Ricketts looked at it and was like, "Wait, what the fuck?" And uh, tried to sue us because he's like, "You can't sell that." I was like, "Yeah, that probably makes sense. We probably shouldn't sell it." Well, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, well, I think you should really just maybe take the uh, if you got to get rid of the Cubs logo. Yeah. Maybe you should bring that back. I, that's a great shirt. It was, and you wore it every single like I did. I don't. I think I only sent you one, but you just wore it every, I wore it every single, day. Yeah, every yeah, day. I, <laughs> I, I cut the I cut it to a V-neck, big V-neck guy, sleeves off. I mean, when I get to when I got to the field, shorts, sliders on, and the we are good shirt. Yeah, every day. it you, was the best. You would like do push ups before games, right, to get yourself warmed up. It's just one of those. Yeah, well, that wasn't that didn't get me warmed up. It was just kind of one of those last like things that I would do before I would start playing catch because I mean, the warm up was happening like hour two hour before the game. That was just kind of that was a little showmanship for the fans. Yeah, that's what I figured. I was like, I don't think that doing doing shups on the field really gets you like an extra. <laughs> no, two no. Yeah, yeah, like like if that was that was my only only warm up, just like six push ups. <laughs> yeah, I am cool. also. I don't want to bring up bad memories, but I also am convinced the 2015 NLCS. If you had worn sleeves, it would have gone differently. You were, Man, you were you were sleeveless. That was like one of the coldest baseball games I've ever been to. Well, and you fortunately, were just badass with no sleeves. Well, look, look the if anyone can do it, it's a starting pitcher because you're out there, you're moving right every pitch, right? So you're 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 max max effort or exerting effort. 10, 12, 12 seconds, you're doing it again. In between innings, you go in there, you throw your jacket on, whatever. I just I've never liked the sleeve. It just would always screw with me. And then guys like. Um, that could wear those old school baggy sleeves that would come up over your hand. Yeah. Yeah. Like psych psychopaths. So I just, I would lather some red hot or whatever. And it was tank top and then Jersey. Like that's just, <laughs> and it was like, it was no joke, was like 40 degrees with like a 15 mile an hour wind. Well, I was like, what was colder, players. yeah. Yeah. What was colder was game two in Cleveland. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was unbelievably cold, yes. you know? But yeah, that's just kind of, kind of my deal. I, uh, Hated sleeves, man. So I try to stay as warm as I could. 
so I could go out there and they'll slay. And you, you were never a guy that would put on like I, I always love it when pitchers would put on the uh, the warm up jacket oh, when they get on base. Oh, it's like we're not even going to try to run here. <laughs> I absolutely, absolutely hated it. Really, you know. Uh, <laughs> That I've always been against. I just think it's such a bad luck, you know. Yeah, like, are, are, like are you? Are you? Yeah. Well, hey, look, I can't take any anything away from Greg, right? Mm-hmm. He's unbelievable, but cut it out with the jackets. Yeah, I, I love it. I kind of love it in in a weird way where a pitcher gets on base and they're like, "I really don't want to be here right now. I'd much rather be in, in the yeah. dugout." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I understand not wanting to run the bases. That's especially if you you know say you're on first base and there's it's a full count. There's six foul balls in a row, right? Like you got to take off. You got to come back. You got to take off. Like mm-hmm. that, that's, that's not where you want to be, but the jacket's got to go. It's yeah. got to go. Like, are you really, are you really that cold to where you can't wait a few minutes? It's, yeah. You know? it, it's a good, it's a fair point. I, I've actually, we, we've talked so much. I have one last, last question. I was just reminded of, of game six in Cleveland. Um, was it a little bit bittersweet going out there and winning that game, knowing that Marlins man wasn't in attendance? I don't even think about that. Um, really? That would be the first thing I would think about. Didn't uh, you know? I mean, but you can, you know, he's fucking there, right? You see that, especially it's like, well, what do you do? You're the only guy in this color shirt. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, he didn't go to Cleveland because um, the fans attacked him there. It, right. has, it has nothing to do with the fact that you can't see behind home plate on television. Um, right. It's just he right. didn't. He didn't like the people there, so right. he didn't. Well, show we up. were we were told we were told like, hey, when you leave the field or your family and friends leave the field, tell them to not have their Cubs gear. Which, you know. So Marlins Man was right. Yeah. Marlins Man was right. Well, especially if you're in a damn construction shirt. Like, <laughs> you can see that from, from anywhere. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, it takes sketchy, but hey, I, I love Cleveland. I've had I've had a blast there. And it's funny when I get the question, hey, like, early in my career, what cities do you not like? Yeah, I'd have a couple. But now, it's like, when you played long enough, you have your spots, right? Like, you have the places you like to go. You got your food. You got your golf courses. And you're and you're good to go. Mm-hmm. I love it. I love Chicago, it. San yeah. Francisco, and New York. So, you'll be yeah. you'll be voting for Biden again? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me? Uh, uh, thank you, Jake. No, I don't think so. Yeah, guys. Hey, it was a blast. You're the best, man. We appreciate it. Hopefully, uh, we'll see more of you. No doubt, no doubt. It was good being with y'all. Yeah, good to meet you, man. Jake Arrieta was brought to you by our great friends at Shady Rays. I'm wearing Shady Rays right now. They're the official sunglasses as part of my take. Summer's coming right up. It's spring. It's sunglasses season. It was nice. It was beautiful outside this weekend. was wearing my sunglasses the entire time. And Shady Rays is the official partner, part of my take, and they're hooking you guys up. They want to hook up the award-winning listeners to get – your hands on a pair of Shady Rays. They've got an outstanding combination of fit, style, and performance without the big brand price tag. And it doesn't just stop at the quality. Shady Rays offers the most insane protection program in all of eyewear. Every pair is backed by their lost and broken replacements. If you lose or break your pair, even on day one, they're going to send you a brand new pair. Wear with confidence wherever. You can wear them on a lake. You can lose them on a lake. You can lose them going for a hike in the woods. You can lose them playing basketball outside. You can break them playing sports. They're going to hook you guys up with a replacement. They can also provide 10 meals to fight hunger in America with every order. They've donated over 20 million meals to date. Look good in your shades. Feel good by making an impact. If you don't love them, exchange for a new pair or return them for free within 30 days. There's no risk when you shop with Shady Rays. Their team always has your back. And for our listeners, Shady Rays is giving out their very best deal of the season right now. Go to ShadyRays.com slash PMT50 for 50% off two or more pairs of polarized sunglasses. That's right, 50% off, half off two or more pairs of polarized sunglasses just by going to ShadyRays.com slash PMT50. Get 50% off two or more pairs of their polarized sunglasses. Okay, let's wrap up. We got a Monday reading. By the way, I watched the Jordan Speed video the baby has every right to cry, but that baby was never going anywhere. So that was like a that was a like the baby's probably like, what the fuck? This sucks. Yeah, the baby did not. The baby have was a never good, going. That, that ball, you could punch that baby time. out, it wouldn't go anywhere. I don't know. Yeah. I there's she there's some him. running back coaches watching that she sweat right now. She had him. Um, okay. This is brought to us by Billy. Billy actually came out. Billy, you want to do the reading? Sure. All right, let's do it. This is good reading. Go off, Bill. Let me pull it up. I found it. On Reddit, and I forget what exactly. Here, I can. You send it to us. I can yeah, send it to I'm you. Pulling it up. I think it got. Sp- 
deleted so I can send you the screenshot. Here. Oh, yeah. Boom. Boom. Perfect. Billy Football. Which, what's, what's subreddit? I think it is from the AITA, Am I the Asshole subreddit. Oh, nice. No, it's from Relationship Advice. Mm-hmm. Nice. Perfect. Okay. Go. So I know this is a weird question, but my boyfriend likes to spend a lot of his free time digging a tunnel on some property that he inherited. I haven't seen the full extent of it, but last I saw, it was remarkably deep under the surface. He spent roughly a year on it, and it's evident. The front of the thing is deep, wide, well put together. At the front, which is the only part that I've seen, he's got cement beams, electric lights, <laughs> even chairs, and a small Wait, table. Time out. Okay, time out real quick. I obviously with the the table and everything, but for a minute there, I thought this was gonna be one of those joke posts, like plot twist. I'm married to my dog, because like, wouldn't that make sense? That like my boyfriend <laughs> slash my dog is just digging a huge hole or, or maybe it might be a guy that's got like a, a cosplay fetish where he likes to pretend that he's a dog and that's yeah. what he's doing there the the first thing that you mentioned that really caught my eye that i i don't remember reading about before is this is inherited land mm. so it seems like i'm just thinking this might be a treasure hunt thing right off yeah. the bat like maybe there's a will that's been left where it's like you you know i'm gonna leave you three riddles and that's the clue as to where the treasure right. is on the property read that last sentence again about uh the the construct of the of the hole the front of the thing is deep wide and well put together at the front which is the only part that i've seen he's got cement beams electric lights even chairs and a small table okay this part this is actually crazier that i how do you have a, a tunnel in your backyard and not want to go in it that she hasn't visited. Correct. Because I don't think he lets her in. Okay. I feel okay. like this is like his clo- This is a yeah. little man cave. I'd like to go visit this. Okay. Yeah. I haven't gone into it, but it looked like the quality severely dropped as the tunnel went further. Well, duh. That's you get tired. How a tunnel works. Yeah. Yeah. You might. You want to make it look nice on the outside. Yeah. You think like a coal miner? You think it's a fucking luxury bedroom at the bottom of that hole? Mostly becoming open dirt with some wood beams holding it up. My biggest concern is his safety. Yep. I'm really worried that he's going to dig too deep and it'll collapse on him or something. Okay, she's ride or die. Because, like, you're, her biggest concern is not, hey, my boyfriend just keeps going out every day and digging a tunnel. She just wants him to not get to come back yeah. every day after he's done digging the giant tunnel. Yeah, like, have fun with your little tunnel, just with, don't get hurt. The tunnel project, she's... I, it sounds like they need to have a conversation. Like, all this seems like it could be solved with her just being a normal, supportive spouse and being like... Hey, what's the deal with the hole? Yeah. Can you just walk me through it? Real yeah. Quick? Are we getting some treasure? Because I'm in. Yeah. What's what's your motivation here? Approach it that way. Okay. I've tried voicing this concern to him, oh. but he just laughs it off and assures me that he'll be fine. Aside from safety That's, concerns. That is. <laughs> no. <laughs> that, no. Whenever a guy says you worry too much, that means that you're actually in that moment not worrying nearly enough. Yeah. That's every time I go pick, pick up hoops. I'm like, I'm, my back is fine. Yeah, I'm be fine. good. I'll be fine. So this hole, is he digging it by hand? Is this a shovel situation? I, it gets Does into it equipment? later. Okay. Aside from safety concerns, there's also the fact that he doesn't really have a social life because of this thing. Oh, uh, yeah, he does. He's digging the hole. And, and also... Pro- he probably has bros helping him out with it. Yeah, has, she clearly hasn't seen Feel the Dreams. Like, if you build it, they will come. If, mm-hmm. if you one day are like, hey, guys, want to check out my, like, mile long tunnel it's like that video if you if you've seen the tiktok of the dudes just digging a hole at the beach and then within like five minutes other dudes just stop by and they start digging yes if you if if a guy just if any of you and obviously new york city is a little different but if any of you at any point in your life were like hey i've been working on this tunnel for a year you want to come check it out the answer is yes Mm -hmm. no matter what guys love holes yes I'm pretty much the only person he still talks to outside of his job, and he doesn't go out and do anything anymore. It used to be dog. It's a dog. (laughs) It used to be that he'd occasionally head out and do some digging on the weekends, (laughs) but now he spends almost all of his free time out there. He still comes home, but he barely spends any time with me, and I know that he isn't doing anything but digging that damn hole in the ground. This can't be good for his mental health, but I don't know how to convince him to stop. He's always really happy when it, he comes back from digging, which is why I haven't seriously Wait, tried to stop him before. I think it's 
great for his mental health. Yeah, it sounds like he's he's getting rid of all of his stress and negative energy in a productive manner on yeah. his construction project. Also, just the idea of having like a task that you have to complete and just throwing yourself into it, that's good. I also think that as men, when we're growing up, we're told that our lives will have so many adventures in them. Oh, I thought you were going to say we're told that you can't actually dig to China. No, I, okay. well, I was told. Maybe he's trying to find the devil. Maybe he's yeah, just digging yeah. until he finds Satan so he can kill him. Yeah. But I, I think that, like, as we're growing up, I w- at least I was under the belief and the assumption that I would have just nonstop adventures. Like, you discover something and then you go on a, a treasure hunt. Or, you know, like, we're told through cartoons and movies and I think that guys just need adventures sometimes. And it sounds like he's found his adventure, which mm-hmm. is we should be applauding this and encouraging. I want to help him. him. Yeah. Wait, does he drop a location? Hmm. Going on. Obviously, I don't think he's insane, <laughs> but I hadn't considered. Uh, I had to swipe left to the new one and find my place. Obviously, I don't think he's insane, but I hadn't considered the mental health aspect of this, and I just don't know what to do. TLDR boyfriend spends all this time <laughs> digging a tunnel and I'm worried for both his physical and mental health. I well physical no. Well, I guess the t- tunnel collapsing, yeah, I guess that would be whatever. That throw that aside. It sounds like he's actually reinforcing it pretty well. I think this guy is a genius. Like I what, what are we what what do most people complain about these days? Like 2022, everyone's on social media, everyone's living their life online, everyone's looking at a screen. This guy's found a way to beat all of that by just building a never-ending tunnel. It sounds like something that would happen on South Park. Like this guy sounds like Randy Marsh. Actually. Yeah, I could see an episode of Randy just decides to dig a dig a giant tunnel in his backyard. Or now this just popped in my head. This could also be Elon Musk. Isn't he a big tunnel guy? He's a big tunnel guy. Yeah, and he just never completes them. Yeah, he was digging that one to Halsey's house for a while. Yeah, so maybe it is. Could be Elon Musk. And this could be written by Halsey. Yeah. No, she's too busy watching the the playoffs. She's a big NBA. By the way, she's she ve- was firing off tweets. She's very funny on yes. Twitter when she's talking about basketball. Yes. Um. I. It's it's the old meme of like guys will literally dig a giant hole in their backyard for years at a time instead of going to therapy. Yes. 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 It sounds like this is his his stress relief right here. It sounds like, it, I, I would I would be more concerned if he just stopped digging the hole. Yeah. All of a sudden, because then he's got all that pent up whole aggression and nowhere to take it out on. So looking in the comments, one of the biggest remarks were that the greatest danger would be hitting uh, pockets of natural gas. Yep. So if the tunnel doesn't collapse, just he could hit some gases that would knock him out. Get a, sounds get a like canary. he's in an area though that, that, Oh, natural gas, but natural then they gas. could be rich. That True. could be the if, rest of their lives. If he dies, then guess what? It means that he's probably found a tremendous source of energy. Yeah. Right. I, I, Fracking. I un- He's fracking. <laughs> I understand <laughs> that uh, that concern, but that's why they used to have actual canaries they'd keep down there in coal right. mines. So the canary dies, and they're like, fuck, I got to split. This bird's dead. So that's what she's got to do is she's got to buy a bird. Buy him a bird. Yeah. Buy him a bird. Mm. Problem solved. Also, I want to go help this guy. Like, if we I could figure out a way to find this guy, pardon my take road trip. Yeah. Absolutely there. I, I also think, like, they, this could be a long elaborate just like suey thing that he's doing where he's just like i'm gonna dig this hole until i die he's building himself a tomb yeah just death by <laughs> hole have you guys ever seen lovely bones no nope well there's a dude who dug a hole and he did bad things in it Whoa. oh you think he's yeah, got like bodies. buffalo bill kind of shit he's got yeah. hose down there he's got uh, yeah yeah well all right, so if that's the case, then cancel the road trip. Ah, no, no, no. No. Let's go on an adventure. Too. Yeah, no, if so we yeah, found adventure. it, we were the ones who... Then we will bring heroes. dog. Yeah. No, one of us would have to stay back in the car. That's all we got to do. Jake. Shut yeah, up. Jake. Yeah. And then if we don't come back, then just call the cops. Save the children. Like, yeah. th- this could be us, like, actually saving maybe hundreds of lives. Or, this, this or us awesome. having a great time. This guy's yeah. awesome. I just want to at least talk to him. Let's get him on the podcast. Dude, he's got a table with chairs, so you could definitely, like, play some drinking games on it. He's so, building a bunker. So, yeah, what does he have the multiple chairs there for? It sounds like he's having, he's already having dudes over. Yeah, when his friends help show up. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. He knows that eventually this will be the biggest attraction in his town. This honestly sounds awesome. Yeah, like, I'm, I'm in. I'm thinking of being a kid going out in the backyard and just digging. Finding rocks and shit. Yeah. That was maybe the best time I've ever had in my life. Yes. I would love to dig a hole right now. Every day. Let's go dig the hole. Also, don't need a gym membership. 
Mm-hmm. Fucking digging a hole is hard work. It's a great workout. Yeah. There's no better tasting drink than like an ice cold lemonade uh-huh. after you've been digging a hole. A little, little dirt under your fingernails. Mm-hmm. We're in. We're in. Jake, what are your thoughts on, on hole gate? If I see a hole, going down in there won't help much. Yeah. Just like stay away. You're not a hole stay guy? Stay away. Yeah. Not a caveman? Any holes? Yeah. Can't get worse. In the hole? It could get better. Yeah. What if there's gold? Then there's gold. Yeah. Feels yeah. good. What if we're being bombed? <gasps> True. You raise good points. What if there's a tornado? Yeah, what if this is a shelter he's building? This reminds me of the song that Billy was playing right before we... Uh, we he uh, oh. He attempted the 72-ounce steak challenge, which is called... The song's just called diggy diggy hole and billy we were driving down the street in like uh no it was in arizona because billy was like hey do you want to hear a viking metal song about digging a hole i was like fuck yeah Just put it at the end of the show yeah yeah toss it on here diggy yeah. diggy hole diggy diggy hole it's actually hilarious it's by this italian uh band that dresses up as gnomes <laughs> and they just sing about like digging a hole and yeah. they like perform as gnomes okay. not gnomes Amen. dwarves well then put it on yeah put it at the yeah. end of the show and and please someone if anyone is listening to this and knows Hole Guy and wants to reach out, we'd love to have him on the show and then go visit his hole. And help him. Yes. With his mission. Yes. All right, numbers. Five. Give me a uh, Six. 37. First tennis player ever on Wednesday's show. 70 minus one. 22. 25. None of us have gotten it in a long time. 37. Say that again. Two. You've never gotten it. Three out of play. Come down. 63. You've never gotten it, Hank? Second time. You've Wait, we've, we've all gotten this. it except Hank? I, I didn't know that. You definitely had it before, Hank. Wow. We talked about this like a week ago. But sure. <laughs> That's like the worst streak ever. Damn, you suck at this. Yeah, I do. Love you guys. Chimpanzees regularly hunt monkeys.